Good morning. I'm Councillor Jennifer McKelvey. I am Chair of Scarborough Community Council. The clerk has confirmed that we have quorum, so I'd like to now call the meeting 18 to order. Welcome, everyone. Today's meeting is being held with members of council participating both in person and by video conference. Staff, city staff are also connecting to the meeting via video conference. As the city remains closed, as City Hall remains closed, the public can continue to participate electronically and can watch the meeting streaming live on YouTube at youtube.com slash Toronto City Council Live. I ask everyone for their patience with any delays and technical issues. The city's staff have connected all registered speakers to the meeting by audio. The list of speakers can now be viewed online by visiting the Scarborough Community Council page at toronto.ca slash council and clicking the speakers box for today's meeting. Clerk's IT staff will also be available to assist members with their devices. I would like to remind staff to keep their mics muted and their videos turned off unless they need to answer questions or speak to those on, on the committee. This will make it easier for me as chair and for those watching on YouTube to observe members as they participate in the debate and vote on items. For those members who are joining us remotely, please keep your mic muted unless you wish to question staff or speak to an item and ensure that your video is turned on. As part of each agenda item, I will ask members to raise their hand or unmute their mic if they wish to question staff or speak. I will then create a speakers list and I will call, call on members when it is their turn to speak. When voting on an item or a motion, I ask that members ensure that they turn on their video, if applicable, to raise their hand to indicate their vote. Members, I want to remind you that you must submit and approve your motions by email. Staff are available at scc at toronto.ca to help with your motions. If there are any visiting members of council attending this meeting today, I encourage you to turn on your video so that I know that you are present and can give you the opportunity to ask questions of staff or speak. This will also assist the city's uh, clerk staff to record attendance for the meeting. Although we are meeting in different locations and remotely today, the community council would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also recognize that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? If you do have an interest, please raise your hand and unmute your mic. Hearing none. Uh, next, we need a motion to confirm the minutes from our last meeting held on September 15th, 2020. So moved, Councillor Ainsley. Mo moved by Councillor Ainsley. All those in favor? Any opposed? The item carries. Thank you. Members, we have 12 items on the agenda for today's meeting. We also have 22 speakers. We'll now go through the order paper. Item SC 18.1, Golden Mile Secondary Plan, Final Report, Ward 16, 2021. Uh, we have 19 deputants on this item as well, I believe, as some motions. Councillor Thompson, would you like to hold the item? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Uh, item SC 18.2-1910, Eglinton Avenue East Zoning Amendment Application mm -hmm. Preliminary Report, Ward 21. Um, Councillor Thompson? Uh, Madam Chair, I, I'm moving the item except I'd like to just ask the clerk if we could um, change the, um, the distribution to uh, from 120 metres to 300 metres. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. They will hold that, and then once we finish the order paper, it should be prepared. We'll come back to it. Uh, item 6, uh, SC 18.3, uh, um, Councillor Thompson, this is 2206 Eglinton Avenue East zoning application and 2200 to 2206 Eglinton Avenue East, 1020 to 1030 Birchmount Road and 75 Thermos Road draft plan of subdivision application preliminary report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, similar to the prior, I'd like to just um, expand the notification area. Uh, thank you, Councillor Thompson. Is that 300 metres as well? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. They'll prepare those motions. We'll come back to them at the end. Uh, SC 18.4, 3051 to 3079, Pharmacy Avenue, Zoning Amendment Application Preliminary Report, Ward 22. Um, this is, um, we have consulted with the Ward Office. Um, does anybody else have questions or like to hold this item? Would somebody like to move staff recommendations? 
Councillor Thompson, all those in favor? All those opposed? Item carries. Item SC 18.5, refusal of a clothing box, drop box location permit application located at 1967 Lawrence Avenue East, Ward 21. Councillor Thompson? I'd like to move the staff recommendation. Great. Uh, did anybody else want to question staff or speak to the item? Excellent. All those in favor? All those opposed? Item carries. Item SC 18.6, parking amendments, Kingston Road between Wood Glen Road and Midland Avenue, Ward 20, Councillor Thompson, uh, sorry, Councillor Crawford. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I will move the staff recommendations. Great, did anybody else want to speak or, uh, or question the item? Okay, thank you. We will uh, vote on the item. All those in favor? All those opposed? The item carries. That brings us to SC 18.7, traffic calming review, Keeler Boulevard between Nielsen Road and David, Dr David Drive, Ward 25. Councillor Ainsley, there is a deputant. Would I, can I hold it in your name? Yes, please. Item SC 18.8, all-way stop control review, Deep Dean Drive and Camera Court in Ward 25. This is mine. Um, I am happy to release this with an amendment, um, if we can put that up. Yeah, number Thank you. I've pre-circulated this. This is that Scarborough Community Council authorized, authorized all-way compulsory stop control at the intersection of Deep Dean Drive and Camera Court. Councillor Thompson? I'm ready to vote. <laughs> oh, you're ready to vote. Okay, great. Okay, all those that, so nobody wants to speak to the item. Um, all those in favor of my amendment? Thank you, Councillor Thompson. All those opposed? I will let you know that there is a mayor, the mayor of Camera Court. I have promised him that we will do an official ribbon cutting on this stop sign that he has been trying to get to six years. So I just want to congratulate the mayor of Camera Court on this, uh, this great victory. Uh, that brings us to item S. Madam Clerk, Madam Clerk, point of order. Who is the mayor of Cameron Court? What is his or her name? Uh, the mayor has only ever told me his name is the mayor of Camera Court, so... Uh, oh, okay, thank you. Uh, okay. I know his oh, neighbor's names, I know all the other neighbor's names, but I just know him as the mayor of Camera Court for six years. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, SC 18.9, speed limit regulation, housekeeping on Durnford Road, Ward 25. This is in uh, my community. It is a housekeeping item. Uh, the, the bylaw and the speed limit sign aren't matching, so this corrects that. Uh, any questions or speakers on the item? Okay, uh, we'll move to the vote. All those in favor? All those opposed? Uh, the item carries. Thank you. We will now be able to have an uh, automated speed enforcement in this area in front of the school zone. Thank you. Um, item 18.10, all-way stop control on Beach Grove Drive and Fergalee Avenue, Ward 20, uh, 25. Uh, this is uh, one deputant I'll hold, as that's in my community. Item 18.11, all-way stop control on East Avenue, Ward 25. I'm prepared to move this if there's no other speakers or questions. Okay, um, we'll move to a vote. All in favor? All opposed? Um, I don't think we're having a ribbon cutting on East Avenue. Maybe we have to do that now since we're doing it on uh, camera court. Uh, that brings us to item 18.12, application to remove a private tree, 57 Pegasus Trail, Ward 24. Uh, Councillor Angeli, there is a deputant. I'll hold in your name. I'm um, sorry, Madam Chair. Could you just clarify for me? It says um, submission filed by their name. So are they actually making and deputation this morning? Correct. There is one registered speaker on this item. But it says submission filed beside their name. They also did submit to speak verbally. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so are the motions ready for items 18.2 and 18.3, um, Councillor Thompson's items?
Okay, this is Councillor Thompson's amendment to increase the distribution area. When we switch back screens, we'll call the vote. Okay, all those in favor? All those opposed? That item carries. Item 18.3, uh, 2206 Eglinton Avenue East, zoning application in 2200 to 2206 Eglinton Avenue East, 1020, 1030 Bridgement Road and 75 Thermos Road, increasing the distribution area. The motion is now prepared for Councillor Thompson. Once we move back on the screen, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? All those opposed? This item carries. Uh, thank you. So that leaves us with uh, the four items that have deputants. The first one is SC 18.1. I understand that staff have a presentation on the Golden Mile secondary plan. We'll go to the staff presentation. Uh, we'll then move to deputants, and then we'll go back to questions of staff, because the deputants uh, may also, uh, listening to them may also raise additional questions from us. I will say that I am ducking out in about five minutes for about half an hour, we will be in the very capable um, hands of Vice Chair Councillor Lai. Uh, so uh, if I don't pop back on the screen, um, she is taking over and we're in good shape. So um, thank you, uh, Mr. Zuliani. The floor is yours. Good morning, Community Council. We are pleased to be here uh, today to continue uh, the public meeting on the Golden Mile Secondary Plan. We have a brief presentation for you today regarding the, the changes that have been made to the document since we last met in July. And I will now hand it over to Emily Codwell, the senior planner um, in charge of the project. Take it away, Emily. You hear me? You were good, Emily. Okay, my apologies. Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, Amanda, if you could pull up the presentation, that would be appreciated, and we'll get started. Thanks very much. Good morning, good morning Madam Vice Chair and members of Scarborough Community Council. I am here on behalf of the Golden Mile team. Just, um, to tell you what the team has been up to since the Community Council meeting on July 17th. So let's get started. Amanda, next slide, please. At its meeting on July 17th, Scarborough Community Council commenced a statutory public meeting on official plan amendment number 499, what I will be calling OPA 499 from here on in, including the draft secondary plan for Golden Mile. Community Council deferred its decision on OPA 499 and directed staff to further consult with stakeholders on their suggested revisions to the draft secondary plan. City staff were directed to report back to Community Council in October, and here we are. Next slide, please, Amanda. From August to early October, City staff have reviewed and discussed feedback received on the July version of OPA 499. The Golden Mile team had 10 meetings and additional discussions with stakeholders who provided feedback. The meetings and discussions were focused in an attempt to resolve concerns with the draft secondary plan. Staff have carefully considered the additional input and where appropriate have further refined the secondary plan policies, made minor changes to the associated maps and have refined the Golden Mile urban design guidelines. These refinements maintain the long-term vision for the plan area as a complete, livable, connected, responsive and prosperous mixed-use community. Next slide, please, Amanda. For today's meeting, city staff have provided a supplementary report, which is intended to be read in conjunction with the final report. The supplementary report provides a high level description of key policy refinements, as well as clarification on the intent of certain policies that may have been misinterpreted. Refinements have been made and or clarification has been provided on the following sections of the draft secondary plan. Districts and character areas, land use and density, public realm, built form, housing, mobility, and implementation phasing and monitoring. 
I will highlight some of the key policy refinements and provide clarification on certain policies from these noted sections of the draft secondary plan. Next slide, please, Amanda. Policy 3.2.2 was refined to provide further clarification that the central district will function as the main institutional, social, and cultural hub. However, it is noted that community service facilities will be located throughout the plan area. Policy 3.6 was refined to clarify that an enhanced mid-rise character in the East Park mid-rise and tall building community is intended for a portion of Eglinton Avenue East frontage. Next slide, please, Amanda. Stakeholders were advised that any proposed land use conversion requests, in this case from general employment areas to mixed use areas, would be addressed through the municipal comprehensive review process in accordance with the official plan policies. Policy 4.6 permits the relocation of existing major retail stores and or power centers on the same site or block to allow further flexibility for development phasing options and built form requirements. Next slide, please, Amanda. Policy 4.9 has been refined to include additional wording regarding studies for compatibility and mitigation, noise impact, and air quality, all of which will be subject to the requirements of official plan policies 2.2.4 through 2.2.4.9. My apologies, let's go over those numbers again. 2.2.4.7 through 2.2.4.9. Next slide, please, Amanda. Policy 4.15, which was previously the infamous policy 4.16 from the July version, was refined to exempt additional uses and facilities from the gross, the calculation of gross floor area, namely the gross floor area of public schools and the gross floor area of non-residential uses in excess of the minimum requirement in policy 4.5, up to a maximum of 10% of the permitted density for the site. There is a caveat though, the development application would have to include travel demand management strategies demonstrating that the additional non-residential uses would conform with mobility policies 11.19 to 11.24 of the draft secondary plan. Next slide, please. Amanda. More than 20 public realm policies have been refined since July to provide greater clarity and or flexibility, including an addition to policy 6.3, to ensure that any public street adjacent to or crossing over any of Bell Canada's major telecommunication infrastructure, such as the fiber optic cable network, would be protected. Policy 6.9b regarding the Eglinton Avenue East streetscape improvements has been refined to make the policy intent more clear from a process and implementation perspective. Minimum park sizes had been included in the July version of the draft secondary plan. Policies 6.13 to 6.20 have been refined to remove the minimum park sizes, notwithstanding that the majority of the parks upon full redevelopment, full development of the plan area, will be approximately those identified in the park types and sizes section of the urban design guidelines, which you also have before you today. Finally, clarification was also provided on POPs, publicly, pu privately owned public accessible spaces, public art, and green notes. Next slide, please, Amanda. With regard to why built form parameters were included in the secondary plan, through the consultation process, some stakeholders sought clarification or enhanced policy flexibility on various policies in the built form section. There was also the general question as to why specific built form parameters were included in the policies. The reason is that we need to establish a new built form vision. The Golden Mile today is a very large, underutilized area that will be transformed into a connected, accessible, diverse, complete, and livable new mixed use community. As part of the planning framework that will guide this transformation, key built form parameters are needed to create the vision and define the character areas and public realm elements. In addition, the implementation policies in the official plan with the, sorry, in addition with the, sorry, start, start again twice, in accordance with the implementation policies in the official plan, the secondary plan identifies key built form parameters and objectives, such as setbacks, 
building heights, base building heights and ground floor heights, tall building tower stepbacks, separation distances, and floor plates, as well as building type mix and sunlight objectives. The approach for the draft Golden Mile Secondary Plan is generally consistent with other recent secondary plans, such as Consumers Next Secondary Plan, John Mills Crossing Secondary Plan, and Sherway Area Secondary Plan. Next slide, please, Amanda. Flexibility is important. Staff recognize that while it's important to establish a clear built form vision to guide future development, it is equally important to ensure that the policies are flexible to accommodate site-specific conditions and design considerations. Flexibility is built into many policies by identifying minimum and maximum ranges, providing exceptions, and indicating general policy intent with words such as generally and approximately. As a result of further discussions with stakeholders since July, over 20 built form policy refinements have been made to accommodate additional flexibilities, including five key refinements as shown on this table. Setbacks from parks, mid-rise building height, tall building step back, tall building separation distance, and sunlight. Refinements have also been made to policies related to other built form matters, such as parking and parking structures, active at grade uses, outdoor amenity spaces, and the East Park mid-rise and tall building community character area. Next slide, please, Amanda. It should be noted that the built form policies were developed through extensive consultation with the community and stakeholders. The policies are practical and achievable, especially in the context of how the many of how many larger sites there are in the plan area, which have greater ability to accommodate a variety of building types and built form configurations. We would also like to emphasize that clear and flexible built form policies will support a varied yet coherent built environment and accommodate a variety of architectural and landscape expressions. They will promote design excellence while ensuring that public realm and built form vision for the secondary plan area is achieved with clear yet flexible built form directions to guide development applications, the policies will also help expedite the development review process in the implementation stage. Next slide, please, Amanda. Policy 9.2 is reflective of the objectives of the now council approved growing up guidelines to ensure a range of housing is provided, including units suitable for larger households and families. The policy is consistent with the city's standard unit mix requirements for other secondary plan areas. The minimum threshold of 80 new residential units is included to help ensure that the unit mix requirements do not limit smaller developments. Policy 4.9 was refined to clarify that operable windows, balconies and terraces would only be required where such matters are compatible with adjacent employment uses as demonstrated in accordance with policy 4.9 of the draft secondary plan. Next slide, please, Amanda. The draft secondary plan identifies the required transportation infrastructure to support the anticipated growth in the Golden Mile, focusing on improving access and balancing modes of transportation to ensure a range of travel choices and encourage sustainable travel behavior. The mobility policies in the draft secondary plan recognize the long-term development and implementation of the transportation infrastructure. Various mobility policies provide flexibility both in terms of the process and implementation of the required improvements. Policies 11.2, 11.8 and 11.16 identify that the required transportation network improvements that are identified in the draft secondary plan, such as the location and alignment of the street and cycling networks, will be refined, protected, and implemented through the development application review process, including plan of subdivision process, the plan of subdivision process, a municipal comprehensive, sorry, a municipal class environmental assessment or MCEA as required, or other implementation mechanisms at the discretion of the city. These improvements may also be implemented through identified capital expenditures. Examples of such improvements include the potential reconfiguration and extension of O'Connor Drive, as well as the potential realignment of Thermos Road. Policy 11.8 provides flexibility on the exact alignment and design of the street network that is recommended to improve both east-west and north-south connectivity through the Golden Mile. 
The exact street network will be determined through the development application review process and would not require an official plan amendment. In addition, policy 5.6.9 of the official plan further contemplates that minor adjustments to these features do not require an amendment to the official plan. The combination of policy 11.8 of the secondary plan and policy 5.6.9 of the official plan provide for sufficient flexibility in implementation. The long-term vision of the plan area and required infrastructure was carefully balanced to ensure that the policies provide certainty that the required transportation infrastructure is in place while maintaining a flexible process in securing those infrastructure requirements. Some stakeholders sought clarification on shared mobility hubs. Next slide, please, Amanda. Policy 11.21 describes shared mobility hubs as single service points for bike share, ride share, and car share facilities at locations identified on, the, on draft secondary plan map 45-17. These hubs can vary in size and are one-stop service points that provide comfortable areas to find a share bike or scooter stations, car share vehicles, or wait for a ride share driver. Shared mobility solutions can encourage transit use in the plan area and reduce automobile ownership. As defined in the transportation master plan, shared mobility hubs integrate multiple mobility services in proximity to higher order transit stops, which are identified in accessible locations central to development blocks where on-street car share stations or an integrated bike slash scooter share and bus stop stops are found. The types of functions of each of the shared mobility hubs will be determined through the development review process. In the Golden Mile Secondary Plan final report, which was before you in July, city staff identified the consultation on the Transportation Master Plan and subsequent MCEA work to be undertaken. On August 31st, the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks issued a decision in response to a Part 2 order request, which allow, that decision allows the city to proceed with the implementation of Phases 3 and 4 of the MCEA process which may be undertaken in phases to determine the precise alignment and preliminary design for certain infrastructure, infrastructure projects. Transportation Services has the Golden Mile MCEA in their work program. The exact budget is to be determined as staff scope out the work and the request for proposals. The cost, of the cost to implement the results of the EA has not been determined and is not in the city's capital budget. Next slide, please, Amanda. Policies 13.16 to 13.18 reflect that the transportation network will develop incrementally over the next 20 plus years. As such, implementation, phasing, and monitoring policies are key components to the longevity and adaptability of the secondary plan. Managing growth and monitoring its impact are important elements in the growth management strategy necessary to implement the vision for the Golden Mile. Incremental growth via new development will need to be reviewed in the context of available transportation network capacity until such time as the implementation of the trans transportation network is complete, including the Eglinton Crosstown LRT, North-South Transit priority routes, and new and reconfigured streets as identified in the draft secondary plan. The secondary plan recognizes the significant public investment from all levels of government in the Eglinton Crosstown LRT. However, additional transit improvements are required to provide a complete transit network and to support the anticipated growth planned for in the area. Furthermore, Map 4518 of the Draft Secondary Plan outlines the development areas and street link improvements for the implementation of the transportation network as outlined in Policies 13.16 to 13.18. These policies provide flexible directions on how to implement the transportation network as development proceeds and provide steps that would ensure sufficient transportation infrastructure is in place for development to proceed. With regard to interim uses, a new policy 13.23 has been added and further clarification has been provided in policies 13.24 and 13.25 
to provide additional direction on the potential relocation of existing uses and rose floor area on a site within a freestanding building on an interim basis. These policies would allow greater flexibility for phase development and acknowledge the possibility for the interim condition of such uses where applicable and appropriate. Given the size and scale of such major retail and power centers in the plan area, their proposed relocation into a new freestanding building or buildings would require a satisfactory interim development strategy in accordance with policy 13.25. If such relocation on an interim basis is intended as part of the redevelopment of the site. Additional policy refinements for interim uses have been made to establish a threshold of additions, renovations or expansions to uses contemplated by policy 13.24 without the requirement of an interim development strategy. Where an application proposes a renovation, addition or expansion of greater than 10% of the legally existing gross floor area, including a major retail use, then an interim development strategy will be required as part of that development application. Policies 13.24 and 13.25 do not preclude such existing uses from exceeding 10%, the 10% threshold, but rather require a development application to demonstrate that such an expansion beyond 10% addresses the requirements in policy 13.25. It should be noted that city planning and economic development staff want to encourage the retention of such retail uses in mixed use forms upon full development of the plan area. Next slide please Amanda. The refined secondary plan has addressed numerous comments raised by stakeholders in the plan area. The refined secondary plan continues to provide a long-term planning framework that includes flexibility to allow development to be phased over the next 20 plus years. Leveraging the significant public investment in the Eglinton Crosstown LRT, the secondary plan and related Golden Mile Urban Design Guidelines advance the vision for the Golden Mile as a complete, livable, connected, responsive and prosperous mixed use community that will maintain its role as an important economic driver in the east end of Toronto. The draft secondary plan is accompanied by revised urban design guidelines for the plan area, which provide detailed guidance to assist in the development and review of public and private initiatives in the plan area. OPA 499, including the refined draft secondary plan, has regard for matters of provincial interest under section two of the Planning Act, is consistent with the provincial policy statement of 2020, and conforms with the growth plan also of 2020. OPA 499 is also consistent with the general intent and purpose of the official plan and conforms to the official plan, including the recently approved Official Plan Amendment 479 regarding public realm and Official Plan Amendment 480 regarding build form. For these reasons, staff recommend that the refined OPA 499, including the draft Golden Mile Secondary Plan and Urban Design Guidelines, be adopted. Thank you for the time. your time. That is the end of our presentation. We're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Amini. Uh, we'll hold the questions until uh, we finish with the deputants. And uh, we're going to start with our deputants. Uh, we have 19 deputants. Just uh, to remind everyone that uh, you have five minutes. And then after the five minutes, we will, uh, if we, people have questions for you, then we'll ask the questions. And at the uh, last 30 second point, I will give you a reminder uh, that um, then please wrap up uh, when the time is up. Uh, our first speaker is Larry Watmore. Chairman of Scarborough Community Renewal Organization. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Great, thank you, thank you, uh, Councillor Lai, and um, good morning, Councillors. Uh, my name is Larry Watmore. I am the president of the Scarborough Community Renewal Organization, uh, SCRO for short. Uh, SCRO is an organization of engaged volunteers that works to connect, promote, and renew Scarborough so it can be strong and prosperous. We seek to renew Scarborough on multiple fronts, including arts and culture, the natural environment, and of course, opportunities for economic prosperity. SCRO envisions Scarborough as a complete community 
providing opportunities for residents to live, work, learn, and play. Ensuring the Golden Mile includes an appropriate mix of residential, commercial, and employment spaces will benefit the new residents of this transformational community and Scarborough as a whole. I'd like to start by thanking Councillor Thompson, Chair of the City's Economic and Community Development Committee, and all members of Scarborough Community Council and City staff for standing up for the protection and development of employment opportunities in the Golden Mile. In our deputation to Community Council in July and our further submission in August, we advocated for increasing the minimum provision of non-residential gross floor area in the secondary plan from 10% to 20% because we believe this is in the public interest. We note that many landowners requested that non-residential provisions be reduced or eliminated. We do not believe that this is in the public interest. SCRO has reviewed the revised secondary plan, and while the minimum non-residential provision remains at 10%, we are pleased to see the introduction of policy 4.15. This policy allows landowners to increase the share of non-residential space in a development by an additional 10%, for a total of 20% without counting toward the density calculation. This policy is an important tool for incentivizing the construction of new non-residential space in the Golden Mile. Now, landowners might speak about the short-term uncertainty that COVID may have on office and commercial markets. But SCRO wants to emphasize that the Golden Mile secondary plan is a long-term plan that provides a development framework covering the next 30 to 40 years. As such, we believe that Council should not be swayed by short-term thinking. We need to plan for the long-term prosperity of Scarborough residents and businesses. SCRO continues to be encouraged by the City's decision not to permit the redesignation of general employment area and core employment area lands as part of the secondary plan process. We hope the city remains firm on this and does not permit the redesignation of employment area lands as this would erode the ability of the Golden Mile to become a complete community. SCRO also supports the public realm requirements for an enhanced street streetscape along Eglinton Avenue in the early phases of the development with public art requirements and community spaces throughout the development plan. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Any questions of the uh, speaker? Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Watmore. Madam Chair. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry, I didn't see your hand. Councilor no Thompson, problem. please. It went up really quickly. Thank you very much. And thank you through you to Mr. Watmore. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, you're suggesting to us at this point, as a result of the deferral, there's been an opportunity for staff to work with landowners and of course, SCRO as well, to refine some of the concerns Uh, sorry, that's correct. I don't know if you were finished, Councillor. Yes, I am. Oh. Yeah, just, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, we had the opportunity, of course, to provide further input in August when staff were canvassing all the deputants for, uh, for, additional, um, uh, for additional information, and we were happy to participate in that process. And are you aware as to the work that has been taking place regarding community benefits to ensure that um, employment opportunities will be provided to residents in the area, in Scarborough, and of course elsewhere. There's a tremendous amount of work that's actually being done with the uh, United Way and uh, a variety of others. Are you aware of that work? Is Scroll part of that? Only indirectly. Um, we are certainly aware of the um, the United Way hub, of course, uh, along Victoria Park and the uh, Working Women's Community Centre and the other organizations that are part of that. And we definitely want that hub to be sustained as part of the redevelopment, if at all possible. And uh, we do know that the uh, Toronto Community Benefits Network, I believe that's the name of the organization, has been advocating yes. 
for opportunities for local residents to, to participate in construction employment uh, as the uh, plan is being built out, and we think that's a great idea. Um, you are supportive of um, mix use, mixed development in this area. What you are concerned with and Scro is concerned with is that we don't uh, fall into the trap of simply thinking that this area would be simply uh, one in which we have more residential and not support the commercial history of this area. We want to ensure that this is a live work uh, area that has higher order transit. That's what Scroll would like to ensure um, happens is in this area. Is that correct? That's correct. And I mean, staff have been, I think, um, are quite consistent about that in their presentations, including this morning. And I believe that uh, uh, that community council is aligned with that objective that uh, if, Spro, if this is really going to be a complete community, it has to be a whole lot more than residential condos. It has to provide opportunity for office space, for institutional space, cultural, recreation, uh, all sorts of um, uh, self-employment opportunities, small business retail, restaurants, and perhaps even types of employment that we haven't even thought of yet. So if we really are committed to the notion of with this transformative community being a complete one and not just a bedroom community for others, then this is the opportunity to make that happen. Thank you very much, Mr. Watmore, for your um, response and your participation and your leadership. And thank you uh, to all the members of SCRO for this contribution to this particular very important development in Scarborough. Thank, Thank you, Councillor. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Uh, our next speaker on the list is uh, Michelle German, Vice President of Policy and, St and Strategy for Wood Green. Is Ms. German on the line? Hi, Councillor Lai, it's Carly with City Clerks. We do not believe she's connected to the meeting. Okay, thank you. Then we'll move on to the next speaker is uh, Mark Flowers from Davies Howe. Yes, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm Mark Flowers, a lawyer with Davies Howe and counsel to 1941 Eglinton East Holdings, Inc. Uh, I did provide a written submission to the clerk last week, and I trust each of the members of community council received a copy of that. 1941 Eglinton represents the interests of all of the private landowners within the four acre block at the southeast corner of Eglinton and Warden. And despite being located along the Eglinton corridor adjacent to the proposed Golden Mile Station, the staff recommended secondary plan proposes to designate the subject block for employment uses only, limit the height of new buildings to 11 stories, and restrict the density to 2.5 FSI. And by contrast, immediately across the street at the northeast corner of Eglinton and Warden, Staff are recommending that the lands be designated for a mix of uses, including residential, with building heights up to 30 stories and a maximum density of 3.2. There is no planning justification for treating these two sides of the very same street so fundamentally different within the secondary plan. The only thing staff can point to is the fact that the south side of Eglinton in this location was historically designated for employment uses. However, that is no justification when establishing a new policy framework to guide development within the secondary plan area over the coming decades, particularly when the plan is intended, and you heard this from the planner, to be transformative in creating a new mixed-use transit-oriented community. Our client's planning consultant, Michael Goldberg, made a written submission to Community Council in July in which he provided a planning opinion in support of revisions to the secondary plan to permit high-density mixed-use redevelopment within the subject block, similar to what is proposed for the north side of Eglinton. And likewise, appended to the written submission I filed last week are proposed revisions to the draft official plan amendment and secondary plan that we are requesting be endorsed by Community Council. Many of these revisions are simple mapping changes, but we are also proposing a site and area-specific policy for the block that would ensure that any development of residential uses on the block would at the same time, ensure a minimum amount of non-residential space would be included and a significant number of jobs would be maintained on these lands. As there is no valid planning rationale to maintain this block only for employment uses, we anticipate the staff's reluctance to accept our recommendation is based solely on process. Namely, and you heard this earlier, 
they will tell you the following. First, that what we are requesting is an employment land conversion. Second, that the city has recently initiated a municipal comprehensive review or MCR process, which includes opportunities for requests by landowners for employment land conversions to be submitted to the city until August 2021. And third, that the city's official plan directs that employment land conversions are to be considered through that MCR process. By contrast, I will tell you that council can and indeed should approve the requested redesignation of the block for mixed use development through this secondary plan process. We are well aware of the city's recently initiated MCR process and we recognize that that is in fact one way to achieve an employment land conversion, but it is by no means the only way. We have also reviewed the council resolution adopted at the end of June of this year that authorized the city's MCR process and we confirm that there is nothing in that resolution that precludes what we are requesting today. Policy 22510 of the province's growth plan was introduced last year to expressly permit employment land conversions to be approved outside of an MCR process, provided that certain criteria are met, and we have addressed those criteria through the site and specific policy that we are proposing for the secondary plan. Another criteria for approving the employment land conversion outside of an MCR process is that the subject lands are either not within a provincially significant employment zone or that they are located within a major transit station area. And in this case, the subject block meets both of those. It is not within a provincially significant employment zone and the subject block would clearly meet the definition of a major transit station area. And finally, with respect to the city's official plan, it's important to note that the current employment land conversion policies were approved under the 2006 version of the growth plan, which did not include policy 22510 as it was introduced only last year. And in any event, if there's any conflict between the growth plan and the city's official plan, the growth plan would prevail. Thus, from a legislative and policy perspective, there is a clear path forward to permit mixed use redevelopment of the subject block through this, secondary, through this secondary plan process rather than the city's MCR. Not only can council do so, it should do so. Through the secondary plan process, there would be a number of benefits. It would result in a more expedited approvals process, would allow the secondary plan to be approved in a more integrated manner, and would ultimately allow city council to be the decision maker here, rather than the LPAT or the minister on an MCR. Thus, in closing, we urge community council to reject the staff recommendation for the subject block and instead to endorse our proposed revisions that were appended to our written submission. Thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any question of the applicant? Yeah, Gary. Councillor Crawford. Crawford. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Flowers. Um, just so, just clarification then. Um, so, the, at this point um, in the plan, these lands or that block is designated for employment. Uh, you would prefer that, or your uh, client would prefer that they be designated mixed use high density. Is that correct? Uh, correct. Uh, we've yeah. set out in our in our submission that was filed last week in Schedule A. We've actually been very specific as to the mapping changes. But in essence, you're correct. It would be to change it from employment to mixed use. In in essence, it's really what we're seeking is exactly the same permissions that are proposed by staff for the northeast corner of Eglinton and Warden, literally across the street from our property. Okay, thank you. And, and again, I'll be uh, I'll be uh, questioning staff uh, with regard to that. The other issue you were talking about was more process. Um, so there's two, there's um, a couple of, well, mainly two different ways that we can look at the, these conversions. Um, one is through the MCR process, the Municipal Comprehensive Review. As I understand, that comprehensive review is already in, it has already started, um, and staff are suggesting that if you wanted to go through a process of redesignation of conversion, that would be the correct process. Is that what you, your understanding is? And you would prefer it going through the secondary plan, which would be some sort of changes to the secondary plan today or at council. Is, is that uh, what you are suggesting? Yes, that, that's my understanding of staff's position. I don't know whether they would tell you that it has to go through the MCR or whether they would prefer. Maybe they can clarify that for you. But certainly that's the indication that we've been given, that uh, you're quite right, the city has initiated an MCR process that was approved by council, I believe, at the end of June, what I referred to. And in fact, starting in August, and it, it lasts for a year. So up until next August, the city, and it's available on their website, is saying, landowners, if you are within the employment area, you can make a written request to us to convert your lands. 
That process is going to take years. Uh, it's expected that it will take at least until the spring of 2022 before the city would even be bringing anything forward. And then, of course, it goes to the minister for approval, and the minister can either approve or modify and approve. And again, that could take months, probably into 2023. The alternative, of course, and what we're recommending and what we're asking this community council to endorse, ultimately it's a decision for city council, not community council, but we are asking you to endorse this, is the, in this instance, as you know, the city has initiated a secondary plan. It said this is going to be a transformative plan, notwithstanding the history, this is what we want the future to look like in the Golden Mile. And so staff have brought forward recommendations saying, well, these lands were employment, so we're just going to keep them employment. Our view is now is the time to look at this, um, you know, comprehensively to look at it from the perspective of what is the appropriate land use at this important location adjacent to a transit station on a transit corridor in the context of a plan that says this is to be a mixed use community. And so we're asking community council to endorse a change to the designation on the lands through this process that, again, if you adopt the secondary plan at the council meeting at the end of this month, that's obviously a much quicker process, many more benefits to the city, rather than, you know, waiting a few years or if there's appeals to the secondary plan. So that those are the two processes that you can follow. Clearly, staff would prefer that we go a different direction. We're asking that council endorse uh, going in, in the direction through this secondary plan. And, and thank you. I don't know how much time I have left, but a, a quick question. So, um, y you know, here we are at the last minute, um, you know, making this, uh, making decisions and um, important decisions. Um, how have you been engaged uh, and your client through this process and, and primarily at the beginning of the process? This is like a major change um, that you're requesting us to make at, uh, you know, in essence, the last minute. And um, where have you been? in communicating and advocating for these changes that you have wanted prior to this meeting and, and, and as part of the process. Right. So, as you know, this process began a long time ago, certainly before my involvement with this file. Um, and, and I understand from my client directly, who is the owner of a car dealership, uh, uh, the Nissan dealership, uh, you know, he's not a developer, but um, he didn't participate actively in the process in previous years. But I, I would, with respect, say this is not a request at the 11th hour. Um, this matter, of course, came before Community Council in July. In early July, our client's planner, Michael Goldberg, made a submission. 30 seconds. I, I spoke at the Community Council, and that was months ago, and there was opportunity for discussion in the intervening months, which we had. So I, I would say this is not an 11th hour request. The staff has been aware of it, certainly for several months, and as has Community Council. And, and regardless, now is the time when community council is being asked to adopt the second year plan. This is the opportunity to make the appropriate change. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Flowers. Any further questions of the deputant? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next deputant, uh, Andrew Everton from uh, Ed Councillor Lai, we don't believe this deputant is connected to the meeting. Thank you. Uh, the next one is uh, Richard Domes, Principal Planner, Gagnon Walker, Domes Limited. Mr. Richard Domes, are you on the line? I am. Good morning, Vice Chair, members of Community Council. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Richard Domes of GWD Planners. We represent Bell Canada, the owner of the property located at 865 Pharmacy Avenue, which is the uh, located at the southeast corner of Pharmacy Avenue and Ashenby Road, uh, approximately 100 meters north of Leglington Avenue and the future pharmacy station. The Bell property is currently developed with a five-story central office telecommunication toll and switching building, a 500-foot high communications tower, a series of outdoor generators, and underground communication infrastructure. The existing building and infrastructure are integral components of Bell's communications network. A Bell central office, such as the one located on this site, is the hub for all telecommunications services in the community and performs essential services that cannot be replaced. The Bell Properties facilities and infrastructure provide communication services that are utilized by emergency services, in addition to private, commercial, and residential uses. Pursuant to provincial policy, the Bell Property is considered a major facility. While Bell supports the city's overall initiative to update planning policies for the Golden Mile Secondary Plan, Bell has outstanding concerns related to the Secondary Plan's lack of regard for the long-term use of the Bell Property as a major facility 
as well as the draft secondary plan's lack of appropriate recognition for the property's intensification potential. Bell has participated in various community consultation and advisory and technical meetings over the past several years to discuss their ongoing concerns. Most recently, this included written correspondence and a delegation to Scarborough Community Council in July, when Community Council deferred its consideration of OPA 499 and directed that city staff further consult with stakeholders, including Bell. Following the July 17th meeting, Bell provided city staff with further written correspondence on August 10, outlining its specific policy concerns with OPA 499, along with recommended policy and mapping modifications necessary to address those concerns. Of primary importance to Bell, is ensuring that its structures and service operations are thoroughly considered and protected during the development of the secondary plan policy framework. In our opinion, the draft secondary plan does not sufficiently consider Bell's major facility. A, per a particular concern are the various maps that propose a new conceptual street directly through the existing Bell building, tower, and accessory structures. Given the long-term utilization of the Bell property and infrastructure, this new conceptual street will not be achieved and reference to it should be removed entirely from the secondary plan. Further, the secondary plan maps identify a conceptual alignment of a 27 meter wide public street along and fully within the south limit of the Bell property, which will disrupt existing underground communications infrastructure that is critical to Bell's current and future use as a major facility. In response to this particular concern, city staff have recently proposed a modification to section 6.3 of the secondary plan an effort to protect Bell's major communications infrastructure as part of the planning of future public streets. While Bell appreciates the efforts taken by City in this regard, it is our opinion that a corresponding modification is also required to the maps. The continued identification of the full road cross section fully within the Bell property on the maps is inconsistent with the proposed policy modification in sec section 6.3. Although conceptual and subject to EA study, the current alignment is shown and is misleading and should be identified on the maps further south to remove the acknowledged conflict with Bell's infrastructure and clearly reflect the policy intent of modified section 6. Excuse me, 6.3. Notwithstanding Bell's intention for the continued use of the Bell property as a major facility, the subject site also re represents a significant intensification opportunity on account of the site's proximity to the LRT, location within a major transit station area, and an existing mixed-use area designation. As proposed, the secondary plan inappropriately restricts the Bell's property's intensification potential for those portions of the site that are able to accommodate it. This is on account of the extensive series of public streets, pedestrian connections, and other public spaces on the Bell property, which significantly reduces the amount of land available to accommodate intensification commensurate with its location. Further, the compounding effects of policies that draft secondary plans severely restrict the ability of the Bell property to accommodate tall building built forms including at the south limit of the Bell property where the greatest opportunity for its intensification exists. As it relates to Bell's numerous other concerns, no further policy or mapping revisions have been advanced by staff in the revised secondary plan. And on that basis, Bell advises that it does not support staff recommendations and requests that Scarborough Community Council not endorse draft OPA as revised. 30 seconds. Well, that's my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Thompson has questions of the deputant. Five minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Madam um, Chair. For you to Mr. Domes. So, Mr. Domes, you ind you indicated that um, obviously the importance of the Bell facility to the community and to the city as a whole, that the infrastructure that's there is obviously needed for communication. You talked about emergency services and so on. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. And so you envision that in the future, uh, that particular site will continue to provide the, those types of services? Bell's intent is that it will maintain in the long term, yes. Right. And so um, are you suggesting to us at this point, though, that there are elements and or an opportunity to reconfigure the site in order to also uh, take advantage or capitalize on the redevelopment possibility on that site? In the long term, Councillor, yes. Um, and it's not so much as reconfiguring the site. The, the central office building will remain in the long term. Uh, okay. There is a series of underground infrastructure components that are integral to the operations, um, yes. Yes. which which is, which are significant. Um, these are not your typical underground ducts in a subdivision. These are major, kind of like a trunk sewer, but for telecommunications. Uh, so there's a large process uh, that, and again, a large expense that would go through moving those. 
Um, and that's where the opportunity exists, but certainly it's, it's, it's more of a, a long-term, medium to long-term uh, opportunity. Right, and that's why I really wanted to get at, because uh, as you just pointed out, that the infrastructure, the importance of it and so on, and um, it would be very involved with, with, if you were to remove the, move those. Uh, so there is a potential possibility in the future. The future is obviously a long time that uh, Bell may move um, its operation. That's what you want us to understand today. And you also wanted to ensure flexibility that would be incorporated into the, the obviously, the, 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 the item that we have in front of us that ensures that your client's property um, does not, if you will, um, you know, negatively, it doesn't negatively impact them for the future. That's what you're hoping for us to understand today. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Yes. I clarify that. The, the bell the bell operations are not going anywhere it's more so the the infrastructure that where the opportunity exists to liberate some of the site for redevelopment potential right you spoke in your presentation and madam chair i'm not sure how much time i have left but this will probably be my last question you talked about modification of the maps and i'll ask staff some questions around that can you maybe just elaborate a little bit further in terms of what you mean by that uh, certainly. So um, the, the the first point I raised, uh, Councillor, is the new conceptual street, um, um, street that's shown on maps 45, 4, 7, and 9. That conceptual street is kind of a mid-block uh, public road that goes directly through the existing Bell Building generators and telecommunications tower. That, that road is not going to be... Um, uh, possible uh, in the very in the long term, so our, our our request is that it be removed entirely from the Bell property. Uh, secondly, okay, okay. secondly, the the what is termed as the uh, Golden Mile Boulevard, which is New Street East West Two, I believe, uh, is currently shown as being located with uh, completely within the Bell property along the south limits, and that is the location where this underground infrastructure conflict happens. So our request to staff has been to move that east-west street number two uh, completely off the Bell property to avoid the acknowledged conflict and move it further south. So that would be our request to uh, Community Council. Thank you very much for the clarification. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Uh, our next speaker on the list is uh, Kevin Bouchard from Western Consultants. Are you on the line, Ms. Bouchard? Mr. Bouchard? He doesn't appear to be present. Thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, next on the list is uh, Henry James. Is Mr. James on the line? Also not present. Thank you. Uh, go on to the next speaker is Paul Nichols from uh, Toronto Lands Corporation. Mr. Nichols? Sorry, Madam Chair, also not on the line. Thank you. Uh, going to the next speaker, David Bronx, uh, Bronskill from Goodman's. Mr. Bronskill, are you on the line? I don't believe they've connected. Thank you. Uh, next on the list is Andrew Jeanry from Bennett Jones. Also not connected. Thank you. Next on the list is Maggie Bassani from Aird and Burles. Also not connected. Thank you. Next on the list is Isaac Tang from Borden uh, BLG. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of Community Council. Uh, we represent. Yeah, five minutes. Thank you. One hundred two. Thank you. One hundred two eight five seven seven three Canada Core, which operates as Art Life Developments, and uh, we thank you for your time this morning. We attended at the last Community Council meeting in July, and we made submissions on the secondary plan. Um, but just for context, we'll uh, highlight some of the reasons why we're here. Well, we're the owner of the property at eighteen sixty one O'Connor Drive. This property is less than a five-minute walk from the intersection of O'Connor Drive and Victoria Park and the future O'Connor stop for the Eglinton Crosstown. Our client, Art Life, has active zoning bylaw amendment and site plan applications before the city to allow the property to redevelop into a nine-story, mixed-use, mid-rise building with over 250 residential units along O'Connor Drive, which is identified as an avenue. 
to be clear, we are not seeking a tall condo tower or densities, which is being proposed on the west side of Victoria Park, which are about 4.0 FSI. Our proposed development does not require an OPA. The development fully conforms to the site and area specific policy 400, uh, which was adopted by city council in uh, 2012. It also, in our view, respects the urban design guidelines by limiting the height of the building to the width of the street. And most importantly, our client is ready and willing to proceed now. There's significant interest for the redevelopment with approximately 1,500 res registrants, and there would be thousands more expected if we continued with the marketing program, but for COVID. And finally, since the last time we attended before Community Council, there is a hearing scheduled in March 2021 before the LPAT. It is our submission that it is very likely that the tribunal will approve something more dense on the site than what is there now, which is a one-story building containing automotive service uses. And given the proximity of the pharmacy LRT, the existing planning direction in the OP, the SASP, and the provincial policy, in our view, it is very likely that development will be approved. So the question is, why are we concerned about the secondary plan? Our lands are located to the west of Victoria Park. As we advised Council at the July meeting, our main concern with OPA 49 is twofold. First, it fails to recognize the development potential on our site that occurs now by proposing to realign O'Connor Drive right through the site, which is ready to be redeveloped. And second, this OPA introduces new policies which serve to potentially freeze development until the road is realigned. Now, we respond to the council and staff's call for comments as to how our concerns could be addressed in August. The recommended revisions we provide staff were, were simple, and were simply to note that the proposed road and other OPA 499 policies that freeze development should not in any way deter our development from proceeding forward as planned. These proposed revisions were not accepted. As our October letter notes, virtually none of the policies we have identified have changed. The impact of not changing these policies is not only detrimental to our site, it also introduces uncertainty in the development where none exists today. And it is also detrimental to the development of the secondary plan. As we had stressed in our prior letters to the city in July, there are many policies which state that the plan redevelopment of the secondary plan cannot proceed until the required transportation infrastructure has been secured. As Ms. Caldwell pointed out today, the cost of this municipal class environmental assessment is not known. The cost is not in the city budget. And when I'm speaking about cost, there's also other costs, such as costs to the environment, costs to the neighborhood. Those costs have not been assessed. In other words, not only is there no budget for the road, it is unclear what exactly that budget will be, when this realignment will occur, what impacts this realignment may have on our client's property and the neighborhood. By tying permissions for redevelopment or freezing redevelopment until the realignment is secured, the city will in fact be slowing down rather than promoting development of the secondary plan area. As noted in our July submission, thank you, that is putting the cart before the horse, so to speak. And so our request is simple. We ask that the revised official plan amendment be deferred until such time as the city has appropriately evaluated the impacts of the proposed realignment as it is required to do so under the Environmental Assessment Act. And number two, the city has secured the necessary resources to complete the realignment if it is determined that the, through the EA process the, that the road reconfiguration is appropriate. Thank you for your time and we would be pleased to answer any questions members of the Community Council may have regarding our submissions. Thank you. Question of the deputant. Yeah, it's Councillor uh, Crawford here. Um, so just uh, thank you for your deputation. Um, so just to clarify why you are here, you have a nine-story development uh, across the street in, um, on the west side of Victoria Park going through the process to, to want to build um, this uh, development. Um, and now this secondary plan um, puts that, um, I guess, from your perspective, in jeopardy. Is that correct? That, that's correct, Councillor. And our development application was filed almost two years ago in December 2018. Um, 
the city had not made a decision on it at that time. That's the reason why it's before the LPAD. It wasn't a refusal. It was a, a case where, you know, obviously, the city is very busy. We're trying to move the development forward, um, and we're there. We're going to be there in March. And, uh, you know, from our perspective, the development will, will be approved very similar to what we're seeking, which is a nine store development, as you had uh, acknowledged. Okay. Um, and, and I guess as part of the secondary plan um, that's being approved or potentially being approved today, um, so there, and I'll be speaking with staff after this too, there will be an EA process to look at O'Connor. So it is proposed in this plan to have O'Connor in the alignment that, that you presently see that, but we still have to go through an EA process to actually determine whether or not, you know, because as I understand at this point, um, the, 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 the O'Connor alignment goes through the property, but the EA will determine the exact location of that. And, and are you aware of that as well? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, that's correct, uh, uh, Councillor Crawford, exactly. Our, our request is to allow the EA process to proceed as it is required to do. But in the meantime, um, there's nothing in the Environmental Assessment Act, and there's nothing in the Planning Act which permits the city to essentially freeze the development until that time. So our request is to either allow our development to proceed as is or allow the EA Act to proceed. Um, but in the meantime, there shouldn't be any um, undue prejudice to the way that development is proceeding forward okay thank you and 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 again when we're looking at process um you know and this is not uncommon you know when we're looking at these larger city plans um in the event that we go through this ea process um we do decide or the, the process decides the alignment does have an impact to your particular site um we will also at that point you know looking at uh fairly compensating if whether it's through expropriation whether it's through other means um uh, fair market value for whatever that site would have been designated at the time of that so you're aware that um that will be part of the process part of the discussion part of the decision making process as well as we move forward through you madam chair uh, that's correct councillor uh, we we are aware of the process again our request is to um if this process occurs and if it turns out that the ea process determines that our site is required you know we're aware of it and we'll work through that but in the meantime we don't want um the matter which has been scheduled and you know all this community interest in in the redevelopment um uh, be affected um by the ea process okay okay thank you very much those are my questions any, any other questions of the deputant? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Tang. Our next speaker is uh, Tom Giancas from Kingset Capital. Is Mr. Giancas on the line? Councillor Lai, uh, Councillor McKelvey has returned to the room. Okay, thank you. Uh, I pass the chair back to Councillor McKelvey. So not that uh, you're not doing a fantastic job, but I do have some insider information on who is here and who is not. So unfortunately, uh, Mr. Tang is not here, nor is, uh, sorry, Mr. Jankos is not here, Mr. Brown or Mr. or Ms. Sil Sliva. Um, so that would mean that our next deputant is uh, Mr. Nick Pillagey. You have five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of uh, Scarborough Council. Uh, my name is Nick Pelleggi, and I'm representing Samuel Sarek Limited, the owners of 1911 and 1921 Eglinton Avenue East, at the immediate southwest corner of Eglinton and Warden. Uh, on behalf of the owners, uh, Dentons has provided written correspondence dated October 15th, 2020, and appended our previous comments from July of 2020. Uh, we also provided uh, a letter to staff in August uh, per the staff request. Uh, we'd like to thank staff for their consideration of our comments um, and we did have a meeting last week to discuss a specific matter related to O'Connor Road uh, extension. Uh, in addition, we appreciate that some of the revisions have been made uh, to try and address some of the comments in our August letter. Uh, however, some of our concerns remain related to, uh, and our concerns in this case are similar to Mark Flowers' uh, client who is at the southeast corner of Warden. and. Uh, Eglinton. The employment designation on the south side of Eglinton and our, our uh, correspondence outlines that this area is not a typical employment area that requires preservation. Rather, with immediate proximity to two higher order transit stations, mixed use development should be permitted. We believe this is a designation that should be reviewed uh, 
uh, as mixed use is a better uh, opportunity for achieving the planning objectives of the area. Again, with regards to height and density, while the site has access, direct access to two higher order transit stations, the Golden Mile Secondary Plan proposes the lowest density and lowest heights in the entirety of the plan area. Some policies for flexibility with height are now being proposed, but as a base principle, we believe the highest densities and tallest buildings should be located close to transit. Finally, regarding the O'Connor Drive extension, we have previously stated our concerns about the alignment as shown on the secondary plan schedules. We understand the recommendation number three is requesting starting the EA and that the potential for modified options is included. It's our view that the EA terms of reference should clearly outline that all options, including options that extend outside the secondary plan boundary be considered. CEREX consultants have provided three such options in our written correspondence. So in closing, uh, we would recommend that the staff recommendation be modified to remove the employment area on the south side of Eglinton and permit mixed use on the subject lands and clarify that all options for O'Connor Drive, including options outside of the secondary plan, will be reviewed as part of the EA. Now, that was my last comment. I did want to say specifically to Councillor Crawford's comments on uh, Mark Flower's deputation about the last minute nature of the request for the conversion of the employment lands. Um, our client, and, and we have letters dating back to June of last year, May and June of last year, uh, requesting that the employment area be reviewed. Uh, thank you for your time. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, uh, our next uh, deputant that is in the line is Michael Testaguza. Thank you very much, and uh, I applaud the pronunciation. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so, uh, good morning, everybody. And it is still morning, so I can see that and uh, say that. Um, my name is Michael Testaguza from the Big Leary Group, here representing BRL Realty Group, the owners of 1474 Victoria Park. Uh, that site is located on the southwest corner of Victoria Park and O'Connor Drive at the uh, far western limit of the Golden Mile Secondary Town. Uh, from a planning perspective, um, the Golden Mile Secondary Plan does not really provide any new policies or uh, change the policy framework on the subject site, despite the fact that the site's obviously included within the boundaries. Um, the Secondary Plan, in essence, references back to the old O'Connor Drive Avenue uh, study policies uh, for, I think, a majority of the lines uh, in, in character area 8. Um, so. The we at the Big Leary Group have discussed this with staff, and we understand the reason why is obviously, uh, as you've heard previously, the exact alignment of O'Connor Drive is, is up in the air, and that has a large effect on character area 8, and, and as such, it would be kind of premature at this point to provide a new policy framework for that area. Uh, and we understand also that staff are recommending uh, moving forward with the EA process and giving appropriate alignment of O'Connor Drive. So we do appreciate all of that, and um, and we do plan to be active participants in that process. Uh, so further, this is our opinion that following the O'Connor Drive EA process or concurrent with it, um, staff should be reviewing the appropriate land use and urban design policies for Character Area 8, uh, specifically in the O'Connor Drive area, such that if there is realignment proposed, um, you know, a new policy framework for that area can start to emerge at the same time. Um, and I don't believe that this secondary plan process has really created a new policy framework. Um, and, and again, I'll mention that's because at this point, O'Connor Drive and where it's ultimately aligned is unknown. So we understand that um, this process is going to occur in the future. And um, you know, happy with, with how things are put forward right now. Uh, just at this time, looking for some formal recognition uh, that a future planning process for character area eight on uh, the west side of Victoria Park uh, could be recognized. Um, and again, uh, following that, I'd like to thank uh, council for their time, and I'd also like to uh, personally thank staff for their time and effort and uh, discussions on this matter to date. They've been very helpful. Uh, and with that, I'll, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you to the deputy. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, are 
final, I think, possibly, but we'll do a call out. Um, a deputy is Jason Cherniak. Uh, thank you. Good morning, uh, councillors. Are you able to hear me here? Yes, we can hear you. You have five minutes. Oh, okay. um, so I am the lawyer for 1090011 Ontario Limited, which you are more likely to know as the Eglinton Town Centre. It's located at 22 Lubavik Avenue, which is the southwest corner of Lubavik and Eglinton East. Uh, some of the tenants in that location are Old Navy, Cineplex, Old Odeon, and Party City. Uh, I made a written submission for your meeting in July. After that meeting, staff contacted me as well as the other uh, landowners representatives for a more detailed submission. I provided a letter similar to the one that you have before you today, uh, along with the letters from Randy Grimes and Scott Cole that I've sent you. Um, staff did not respond to the substance of our issues and they did not uh, agree to meet with us as I requested. Uh, based on the minor changes that have been made to the plan and the lack of uh, substantive response from city staff, I can only ask that you either reject this plan, remove my client's lands, or adjourn the decision again and instruct staff to meet with us and try to resolve some of these issues. Uh, my client's lands were previously an abandoned General Motors site. It was polluted and required significant remediation. My client wanted to build residential, but the city wanted employment lands, and my client agreed to that. Uh, they cleaned the lands to a commercial and not residential standard. They prepared detailed transportation planning for the revitalization of the area for retail. They constructed Lubavik Avenue, and they serviced the site to allow for a TTC depot, Rona Home Centre, Canadian Tire, and the Eglinton Town Centre, and this all uh, occurred in the late 1990s. Uh, in his letter, uh, Mr. Cole, uh, an engineer, explained that in return for my client's contributions, the city was supposed to collect a TSI charge. The city confirmed that my client had over-contributed by $2.29 million, and to date, it has only refunded $1.1 million. At the time of servicing, my client also provided a security for $817,780. Uh, my office and I have spent five years working on having this security released. Uh, we've been passed back and forth between different staff without success, and I have to say it's been very frustrating. Uh, if nothing else comes from today, I hope that you will instruct staff to resolve this problem. Um, in the letter from Mr. Grimes, he explains that the Eglinton Town Centre pays $2.3 million in property taxes every year. It also provides for 660 jobs on site, plus another 530 indirect jobs, most of which are in the City of Toronto. There is a plan to expand the centre by a further 50,000 square feet, which would increase the property taxes by $400,000 and create 113 new jobs on site. Uh, it's, it seems to me that based on my client's uh, actions in the past, the city has a moral obligation to ensure that any plan it adopts allows the Eglinton Town Centre to be built to completion. The most significant problem with the proposed plan is the, from my client's point of view, is the extension of Civic Road and O'Connor Drive. Uh, it would put a road right through the middle of my client's lands, it would decrease the amount of space available for expansion, and it would also create barriers to pedestrians within the plaza. Uh, in essence, uh, I'd submit to you that the proposal is to force this landowner who wanted to build residential but was not allowed to, to support the building of residential units all around it and give up land for a road to make that happen. It doesn't seem like a fair process, I would submit. Uh, in my letter, I've listed the specific policies uh, that I'm concerned about. I'll note uh, you, you won't see a letter from a planner there, so more policies may be raised uh, if a planner has to be retained on this. Um, I'm not going to list the details again, though. I hope I've been clear in showing how the Eglinton Town Centre has cooperated with the city and provided benefits and environmental cleanup, property taxes, servicing, and jobs. I hope you will also agree with me that city staff should work with my client uh, to refund the final TSI amounts owing, release the security for work that was completed 15 years ago, and try to see if we can resolve some of the issues with the secondary plan that my client has. As far as this proposed secondary plan is concerned, I hope you will agree with me that it should be amended to allow my client to complete the build-out of the Eglinton Town Centre, and uh, that the best way to do that, uh, it seems at this point, would be to exclude my client's lands uh, from the plan, or at least not change anything that affects its property. Uh, if you're not convinced, then at the very least, I would ask you to defer this again and instruct staff to meet with us. I understand other owners uh, were accorded that courtesy, and I do not think that it is an unreasonable request. Thank you. Those are my submissions. Thank you. Are there any questions of the deputant? 
Okay, hey, uh, seeing none, I will do a call to ensure that there are no other deputants on the line, as there were several that we had called and weren't there. Okay, hearing none, we will now move to questions of staff. Uh, Councillor Thompson and then Councillor Crawford, five minutes each. Um, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I guess I'll just uh, um, focus my question on a few areas. Um, I'd like to start with the presentation that has been given by Mr. Domes regarding the Bell Canada lands and his concern about the disruption uh, that it would cause to this the land and the site uh, if we were to proceed with respect to um, building the roadways through the site, and he referenced the site, the maps 45, uh, 47, and 49. I'm wondering, um, had we taken into consideration the impact on this land uh, with respect to the roadway that's uh, the roadways that are being proposed through Val Canada land? Madam Chair, it's Paul Zuliani speaking. Um, I would like to direct matters regarding transportation to Mr. Filippuzzi and Mr. Mr. Au, uh, our transportation planning uh, leads in this project. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, Council. Um, um, through you, Madam Chair, that um, the one of the recommendations that we are uh, proposing is to study the environmental assessment. And uh, through that environment, uh, municipal class uh, environmental assessment, uh, the exact uh, impact and the um, and the alignment and the design would be um, detailed in that process. So that'll be um, outlined there, and Bell would definitely be involved in that process and uh, outlining the concern. And we did meet with them before um, before today, and we uh, noticed some points they made that were valid, and we'll definitely work some of those details into the. Um, uh, request for proposal when we uh, initiate the environmental assessment project. So are you saying then that there will be time, sufficient time, in order to respond and address their concerns as part of the EA has been brought forward by Mr. Domes? Uh, that's correct, Councilor. So it's not necessary now to respond to his concern um, wanting the modification at this time. You're suggesting that as you move forward as part of the EA process, you'll be able to address those because these are major concerns that, uh, you know, the Bell Canada representatives have. And uh, this facility has been there before you and I were born, quite frankly, it's been there for a long time. And I want to make sure that we're able to address the issues that's been raised. You're suggesting to us today, there's not a need to delay this process. There's not a need to um, to suggest that we remove those lines, those, the, the, those roadways. They may very well be removed. You just have it right now slotted on the, um, on the maps as a potential, but not necessarily that this will be what will be in place until such time that the EA validates whether or not this will be allowable. Is that what you're saying? Uh, that's correct. And we do have a policy 11.8 um, in our secondary plan that speaks to that, which allows that flexibility. And um, okay. our, all our maps have reference the conceptual nature of the alignment. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just a few more questions. One is with respect to the O'Connor um, realignment. And I gather that's you. This is will be initiated through the uh, the the environmental assessment, right? As part of the process, you will look you you will look at how the realignment will work. Is that, is that what will take place as part of the EA? That's correct. Yeah. So through the EA, there'll be many scenarios that we'll be looking at, and do not think right. would be one of them as well. So if I were to move a motion to ask that as you go through this EA process, that you look at the option for potential modification that will be presented to you and the team by landowners in the area, this would be something that would be uh, you would welcome? Yes, most definitely. Yeah. Okay. Let me then turn my attention to the um, thoughts around aligning Thermos Road with the road on the uh, the south. I think that is that Civic Road. I believe it's Civic. Uh, it's Cinna, yes. 
Senate, sorry, Senate Road, as Civic is the one further over going um, south. Okay, so Senate Road. I I'm just wondering, why is this being suggested? I mean, for a long time, there has been a real desire to ensure that there wasn't this connection. On Senate Road, as I recall, there's a lot of uh, um, car repair facilities and so on. Some of the concerns we have around those vehicles coming and being brought in for testing in the area around Ashton B and Thermos Road, we don't want that to happen. I'm just wondering why is that being proposed, as well as I'm curious as to whether or not any discussion has taken place with respect to Metrolinks. Metrolinks letter suggests that there is there's been no consultation. Uh, I'm concerned about the amount of properties that we would have to require. And so have you looked at all of those concerns? And if you have, why are you proposing that we make this connection? Um, so through you, Madam Chair. Um, so the Metrolinks was a part of the um, uh, technical advisory committee for the study. So they were uh, involved, involved in the study and the transportation master plan. Um, so they, they were informed of the process. Um, in terms of the, the, the need for this realignment is to kind of fulfill the vision for the secondary plan. Um, I think uh, through many deputies and then through, through Emily, um, it's called out, um, the need for com complete community is needed. And therefore we try to emphasize the need for a complete uh, network in this uh, secondary plan area. Um, so the connectivity is a, a big part of that and uh, trying to provide uh, available uh, connection for all users, um, the people that live, work, and play here. So that connection does provide a safer connection for pedestrian, transit users, cyclists. Um, so yeah, so that's yeah. your, Sorry, your, your past time, but we can go to a second round maybe after Councillor Crawford. Okay. I know this is a big item, so I'll, I'll entertain a second Thank round. Um, Councillor Crawford, you, five Madam minutes. Chair. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, just a question through staff. Uh, more focusing, uh, I'll focus on a few areas myself. Um, uh, in 1941, Eglinton Avenue, and I believe the letter and the deputation um, that occurred from that. Um, so again, there's, there, there's a, I would say, a difference of opinion on, on the applicant or the owners of uh, the, the designation that you've done on that particular area. And it's, it's primarily, you know, that south of King, or south of Eglinton area just that uh, pretty much hugs that whole section from you know uh, warden uh, west on, on keeping it all employment lands um their suggestion is um because um and i think they mentioned across the street you you have high density mixed use um because it's beside a transit node and you know potentially part of the growth plan that they would expect and and want to be designated mixed use residential. Uh, you have um, determined that is not the case. So can you uh, give me a better understanding of why you've determined that this that section specifically needs to be employment lands? Madam Chair, it's Paul Zellini speaking. Um, I will give a brief introduction and then pass it on to Jeffrey Cantos, who um, is our um, senior planner dealing with uh, the Municipal Comprehensive Review citywide. Uh, but I will say that we've heard from, from many speakers today about the importance of employment lands. Employment lands play a very important function in terms of providing jobs. It adds to the mixed use um, community in this area. Um, and to suggest that um, employment lands can be intensified near a transfer, transfer transfer station area, I think, is, is incorrect. Uh, we are looking for intensification of employment lands, but we want to see them intensified with good employment uses and in a way that provides jobs for the new community here. Uh, and I'll now pass it over to Jeffrey Cantos for a discussion about the MCR process. Thank you, Paul. Uh, through the chair, the reason why we take why we, why we look at employment lands and employment areas comprehensively is because they amount to 13% of the city's land base, houses 29% of the city's jobs. So when we look at issues of convert, converting them and conversions, we want to look at them comprehensively at a citywide scale, not just at a site by site basis. So we will look at that comprehensively because it has effects on our local and city economy on a regional basis, we can't look at them on a site-specific basis. So we go through the municipal comprehensive review. Okay, thank you uh, very much. Um, and um, I, I get it. So that, as I said, 
the, the this applicant is saying they would much prefer uh, going through the secondary plan review and you're, you're suggesting that because this is a larger city um you know issue that it's better it has to go through and there so can you talk a bit about the timing so we have an mcr process that is underway um and again this applicant was suggesting it's going to take 10 or 15 years to get to any kind of resolution and and their particular lands whether or not they go through the conversion or not it's going to be sitting there for a long time so you, can you just talk a bit about the um that process of the mcr compared to you know, say the, the secondary plan, which from their perspective is a lot quicker. Um, so you could just talk a bit about that process, a uh, bit of understanding of that. Of course, uh, of course, to you, Madam Chair. Uh, the process for this next municipal comprehensive review, which we started August 4th of this year, will conclude by July 1st, 2022. The province legislates this date for all municipalities within the Greater Golden Horseshoe area to complete our MCR by that time. So um, in, my, in my mind, in my read of the, our instructions from the province, it has to be completed by July 1, 2022, which is in uh, two years from now. So the applicant would have the opportunity to go through that process of correct? That's correct. Okay, and, and again, uh, when you were looking at, and, and this gets into a little more of, of, of the weeds and the detail, when you're looking at the, um, the growth plan, the, the provincial growth plan, um, does this second, and this may be a question to Mr. Zuliani, does the overall secondary plan before us um, confirm, conform to the growth plan, the uh, provincial growth plan? Madam Chair, and, 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 and again, specifically around, I guess, more specifically around transit nodes and uh, nodes of uh, transit that, you know, in the growth plan suggests it should have higher density um, um, in, in them. Through the chair, it's Paul Zellini, uh Councillor, um, we've, we've tried to make it very clear in our report and our presentations that, in our opinion, um, the secondary com plan com complies with the growth plan in every respect. Um, there will be future work uh, around major transportation station areas uh, and protected uh, station areas, and that is part of a work program already approved by Council as well. Um, we believe that the densities are are more than adequate and in fact likely exceed the requirements of the growth plan around uh, transportation station areas and uh, the future work and the province gives us time to do that future work and we will do it and have that information available for the provincial requirements. Okay. Um, and just a quick and question. Sorry, that's, just... you're out of time, So, but I'll go to another round of questions, but we'll switch back. How about uh, we'll switch back? Oh, Councillor Lai, uh, and then pending no objections, we'll go back for another round of questions starting with Councillor Thompson. Sorry, folks. Uh, Councillor Lai, you have five minutes. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, most of my questions have been answered, and I just have a quick one about uh, uh, one of the deputants were mentioning something about the budget for the road, for the realignment. I, I suppose it means uh, O'Connor Drive. Can, uh, can staff uh, tell me whether there's any plans on how this road is going to be built out and, uh, you know, what is, uh, what is the plan for this, this, any budget or who's paying for it, that kind of thing? Now, I'll, I'll direct this to Mr. Andrew Au for uh, the answer. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, yes. Um, so the, the work for the municipal class EA, the study itself, that has been budgeted, um, has been, it's in the work program under uh, transportation services. Uh, through that process, um, the EA process, it will determine the exact cost and the implementation strategy. So we need to complete the EA to understand the, uh, the cost element of the, the infrastructure improvement. So uh, just follow up, follow up on that question. Uh, so we don't know who's paying for the road or is the city going to pay the road or is, the, is, uh, is it going to be in, uh, you know, the developer for this site is going to pay for the road. We don't have any, any uh, indication on that yet, do we? I think there's uh, multiple mechanism, but uh, through the EA process, it will be more uh, clear in terms of the design and the budget of it, it will be uh, clear in terms of how that uh, proceeds. But um, through development application, there is that potential that the developer can uh, um, provide that infrastructure as well. Okay, those are my questions, uh, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, I see no objections as another round of questions, so we'll go back to Councillor Thompson. Uh, 
Hi, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to take another moment to pursue the connection with respect to Thermos and Senate. Um, so there are no residential uh, properties on the south side at Senate, is that correct? Um, through the chair again, I will redirect this to Mr. Andrew Al. Um, I believe the um, um, majority of the land south of Eglinton, uh, uh, Senate is at North South Street, Councillor. Um, so south of Eglinton is um, all mostly employment. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. So it's mostly employment south of Eglinton. Employment, right. And, and, and so you have a number of um, repair, repair facilities on the south side at Senate Road? Sorry, Councillor, I couldn't make that out. Sorry. Okay, maybe bad connection. I'm just asking whether or not there's a lot of um, repair and uh, commercial facilities on the Senate area in the south side. Um, the exact nature of the employment, I'm not too familiar with. That. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, well, I am. Um, okay. So, are you looking at putting a bicycle network in terms of connection and so on through this area as well? I think the intention is to connect the uh, community. Uh, north of Eglinton to uh, to Eglinton, so the connection that Eglinton would have the uh, unidirectional bike uh, cycling uh, cycle track going east west on the north and south side of Eglinton. So the intention is to get the cyclists um, to Eglinton, and obviously there, there's opportunity to extend the cycling network uh, further south. There'll be the, that opportunity as well in the future. So, so in a heavy industrial area, you would like to focus on putting a cycling cycling network. Um, so that the community from the, um, I guess, the north side could be able to ride through that area? Um, with the proper infrastructure, there is that opportunity, um, uh, opportunity. And obviously, safety and operation of all users needs to be considered when um, designing that network. Okay. To add in, it's, uh, Alan, and I'll add in to that comment. Uh, the cycling network in the secondary plan identified in the maps, uh, the cycling network plan identifies dedicated cycling facilities within the Golden Mile secondary plan area. The extension beyond that network into some of those employment uses, both north and south of the secondary plan, are, are a future opportunity where we would look to extend that network. But the primary, uh, one of the primary objectives in the secondary plan is to provide a robust multimodal network, which includes cycling facilities within the secondary plan area. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm just looking at a letter which I received. Um, it has uh, letterhead, uh, Metrolinks and Infrastructure Ontario, IO. And it says that this alignment, speaking to Thermos and Senate, has not been considered in the design or the operation of the uh, ECLRT project and were and are not and we were not aware of any formal requests by the city's transit pro, uh, project group for further exploration as a potential change via the eastbound variation process when did this idea come forward in terms of considering a connection with respect to Senate and thermos since Metrolinks and, and Infrastructure Ontario is saying that was not even a consideration for them. Through the chair, um, Metrolinks, as Andrew identified, has been part of the study process for the Golden Mile. The current design and construction for the Crosstown project never contemplated, but through the Golden Mile secondary plan study process, it was identified early on as one of the five key transportation uh, improvements for the study area. And through the past two years and the Golden Mouth study process is where that opportunity to realign and make full use of the existing signal and crossing of Eglinton um, to benefit the full potential. But, but this, according to this document, it was never mentioned to Metrolinks as part of uh, this uh, desire for the city. That's what this document states. Okay. Um, thank you very much for that. Madam Chair, I have no further questions. This Okay, thank you, Deputy Mayor Thompson. Uh, Councillor Crawford. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it won't be long. I, uh, I guess some a part or some of the uh, uh, questions were already answered. It's with regard to the O'Connor 
realign potential counter uh, realignment in the EA. Um, so just to clarify, you go through the EA process, and it, it will determine that, uh, and, and just with the one uh, deputant, um, that we would need um, the land that this particular nine-story development uh, would be on. We'll go through a process with that uh, owner. Um, whether it's through expropriation or other means to look at, um, you know, fair market value compensation, all of that. If we do, uh, after the EAA suggests, require any land similar to that or any other lands, in fact. Um, can you just sort of describe that process that we would go through um, in acquiring those kind of lands in the event that the EAA goes through uh, private property? Madam Chair, I will again direct uh, the EA and transportation questions to Mr. Au and Mr. Pelopuzzi. So the, the EA process would then uh, would definitely go through the process um, to, to look at the alignments and, and the, the process that needs to involve in, to, in terms of implementing the network. Um, in terms of the expropriation and um, the, the uh, different op options to uh, to secure this land, um, I'm not the appropriate person to answer that question. Um, but um, there's, there's definitely many mechanisms to um, to secure this uh, public street network, um, and development application is definitely one. And expropriation is obviously another process that could be in play. Um, okay. Then they, um, and then, and when we begin the EA process, can you sort of describe the timing of this? I think the uh, deputy was mentioning. Um, it could take a while, and they don't want to be, you know, sitting back, not having that opportunity to realize any sort of development on the property. So can you give me the description of how long this EA process will take place? Uh, it will take um, approximately uh, one to two years um, to, to complete. And the, um, the, the, the planning process application itself uh, can, can happen in parallel of the environmental assessment process. Um, so the two can go in hand, hand in hand and inform each other in terms of the uh, the process in play. Oh, so they can both uh, continue, because I understand uh, the um, deputy was saying that's in front of the LPAT in March, but they can proceed with all of that uh, as, as we go through both processes? That's right. So the timing the timing, and the, the process would have to um, to be in, in, uh, to consider as well, because currently there's no um, the, the environment assessment that still hasn't been started yet. Okay, that's all my questions, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Crawford. Are there any other questions on this item? Okay, uh, who'd like to speak first? Oh, Councillor Thompson got his hand up first. There you go. Five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Chair. I have uh, two motions, and um, I'll s s whichever which one star staff like to start with first. That's great. I think maybe the O'Connor. Uh, drive one would be um, would be great, and basically um, the motion should, is that we're um, at City Council direct the Chief Planner and Executive Director of City Planning and General Manager Transportation to initiate the uh, Municipal Class um, Environmental Assessment Study for the Golden Mile area, which will include options for potential modification to Bartlett Avenue and O'Connor Drive, and consider comments received from landowners and creating that flexibility so the landowners concerns should be obviously top of mind in terms of this process that's the intent the intent of this particular motion to create an opportunity to give greater consideration uh, i have a second motion with respect to sc 18.1 which is the golden mile plan final report and the motion uh, is that uh, city staff be directed to revise all maps and policies in the official plan amendment number uh, 499 prior to being presented to City Council for adoption to delete all reference to the proposed thermos road realignment and reconfiguration uh, north of Eglinton Avenue. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, as a young uh, boy in the community, a, a young high school student, uh, one of the jobs I had was working at uh, Canadian Thermos. Thermos Road is named after the company who built the thermos. And uh, as a young person in that area, there was always great uh, challenges with respect to the drivers from Senate Road coming in and test driving their vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. It's been around the community for a long time. Large trucks and people were not happy with that. Now we're looking at developing a residential community on the, uh, the north side. 
uh, mixed use, obviously. Uh, and and we're saying, okay, it, it would be okay to align the roadway to create that opportunity in terms of configuration. I disagree with that, and I would submit to you that many uh, in the community would disagree with that. I also disagree with the fact that this whole consideration of putting a bike trail uh, in that um, industrial area would not be, in in my view, although I know I appreciate the things that staff is saying is, is that, you know, it would be safe, but I, I would disagree with that. I put move the two motions, but also to now congratulate the staff. I mean, Emily Caldwell and the team, um, and Mr. Zuliani and the team and everyone uh, has done such tremendous work with this, um, you know, secondary plan and the whole process uh, from uh, the designing uh, folks, uh, Shui Pei and others and so on. I've had many conversations with the group. I know they've done an amazing job. I, I, I've never seen a secondary plan review report that uh, everyone's been happy with. And I understand that not everybody will be, is happy with it. And this is not the final uh, outcome. There'll be more uh, coming forward. There'll be processes that will be in place, uh, LPAT and others and so on. There's opportunity for further discussion. I'm thankful to the staff um, uh, who indicated that, you know, the concerns regarding uh, Bell Canada that will be addressed. Um, I believe that it can be addressed uh, so as to ensure that their con their concerns are taken into full consideration as part of the EA process. I want to thank Mr. Um, Whatmore from uh, SCRO and for their contribution in this particular process. It's been very helpful to ensure that we understand that this is not just going to be a bedroom community where people will just simply sleep and wake up and then go to work. We want it to be a mixed-use uh, community, and it will be. This is, in my view, the largest um, development um, opportunity for Scarborough, for the, gold, the Golden Mile, which is the historic Golden Mile. The bomb girls and, and all of the history of this particular area will be realized. I know that not everybody is happy today, and I get that. I've never seen a... Uh, planning process, secondary, otherwise, where everybody is happy. But at the end of the day, the process is, 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 is open for um, further discussion as we go forward. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, this uh, development, um, you know, coming into to, to the foreground and that the residents of Scarborough will be able to uh, see the benefits, both in terms of the job creation opportunities, the number of people who will be living in the area and so on. And so, I, again, I just simply want to, to thank the staff, and I will move those respective uh, motions. I think on the alignment, I think it's really important for the inputs of the landowners there. And on this uh, notion of connecting Senate to Pembroke Road, I fundamentally disagree with it, and I, I do not support it. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Thompson. <laughs> others to speak? Councilor Crawford? Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam um, uh, Chair. Uh, I do want to again thank all of the you know the staff um, who have worked incredibly hard over the last uh, number of years um, on this. It, it's it's never easy when you're looking at a major secondary plan, um, looking to see um, you know our responsibility as uh, city builders on on transforming and and creating the kind of city that we know we need when we see these thirty to fifty thousand people coming into the uh, into the city every year and um, and trying to put those plans in place they're not easy whether it's you know a large secondary plan um, when we're looking at infills in our communities on our, our major streets um, there's a lot of work that has to happen and I think the work that you know our planning staff and, and staff all across the city do is, is tremendous and this is just one example of that. So I just want to thank them for that work. And again, everybody who's been involved in the process, and as my colleague mentioned, um, not everybody is happy uh, through this process. Uh, there's a lot of give and take. There's a lot of work that does take place. We, we have to go back and forth. Um, and we try to figure out where that balance is. And, um, you know, I'm hoping that... Um, even though there is, you know, some of the, the landowners are, are, are not pleased with where we're going, that we do have that opportunity over the next number of years to really figure this out, because I think it'll, it'll benefit, uh, well, the hope is it benefits everybody. Um, but uh, listen, we all, whether we are from, you know, Scarborough or not, I think we all have memories of, of the Golden Mile of that area. I sure do when I was a, a, a young child going to the, uh, 
the, the Knob Hill store there. And um, you look at all Eglinton um, Town Centre with the courtyard, with the seniors, uh, who still go there. And my hope is, is as we go through this transformation, we'll figure out an opportunity, a way to ensure that they still have that gathering place, because I think that's an incredibly important part of uh, seniors, but I think people in general uh, having that opportunity to to gather. And, and as we're looking at this sort of transformational, you know, complete community, complete mixed use community, it's looking at the parks, it's looking at those gathering spaces, is is giving people an opportunity to to live and work in, in, in their area. Um, and and it, it, it's challenging, um, you know, with the complexity and size of what we're going to be doing. Um, is this going to take five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? It's hard to say. Um, but the hope is, is at some point when I think most of us here are long gone, uh, and maybe my grandkids uh, that I've actually brought to the area, and, and they may be looking at the, the fruits of, of the decisions we, we've made already. But, you know, and I just wanted to comment too on, on the one um, issue that was brought up by the DAP, deputy, deputy, I believe, at 1941 Eglinton Avenue. Um, and those are challenges that we have to look at when we're looking at the role and the importance of employment lands um, and retaining employment lands and, and figuring out where the balance is. And, and even though we were not able to meet that, you know, need necessarily for that one applicant, uh, 1941 Eglinton Avenue, there is still a process to look at options or opportunities to look at at, um, increased density. Um, yes, it is through a different process, which is the MCR process, um, um, and it will, you know, potentially take a little bit longer. But I, uh, I wouldn't be comfortable at this point um, wanting or directing staff to look at the conversion of employment lands at this point. Um, and I think the uh, the first deputation from uh, from Scroll outlined that very clearly for me. And I think um, I'm hoping for my other colleagues. So um, again, these aren't easy decisions. Um, we have to balance a lot of needs out across the city. Um, and, you know, I, I will be supporting, um, of course, Town Councillor Thompson's two motions and um, the overall report as it goes to City Council. Just again, I want to thank everybody for their uh, participation in this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Crawford. Anybody else to speak? Councillor Lai. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to add my quick voice to this um, item. Um, speaking of memory, I think some 40 years ago, when I first immigrated to, to the city, I have an uncle who owns a restaurant, a Chinese restaurant at Golden Miles, and I hang out there quite often, almost, uh, you know, every week I go there, and I know the changes in the area, and uh, it's not in my ward, but I've been recognizing that it's not an easy task to, to make changes to our city. But I've always had the analogy saying that if we don't change and uh, people changing around us, we're going to be lagged behind. And we are living in the 21st century and we need to change. But the fact that I think we need to manage the change is very important. And I, uh, I'd like to thank staff and I thank the local councillors for actually working together with the, you know, with change because we need to change as a city. We cannot be you know, lagging behind to other cities. And, uh, but we must change in a fair way. And I've heard about the deputants, you know, thank you very much for coming to, uh, to make your voice heard. And like my two colleagues said that not everybody's gonna be happy, but we, we just wanted to ensure that our professional staff will keep working with you and with everybody to make sure that is a fair play and uh, make sure that we can manage this and then going forward in the next while we're gonna make some changes but uh, we, we I like to, to thank staff but on the other hand I like to uh, ensure and and staff please work with all the people and people you know everybody have their own perspective and everybody have their own interest so it's not easy to balance the interest but at the end of the day we need to work in a fair way to make sure that everybody uh, will benefit from this change and uh, having said that I will be supporting Councillor Thompson's motion as well as I will support the recommendation thank you Madam Chair just on a point of order yes I just realized when I spoke, I, I don't think I actually moved the item, but I did want to move the item. So that, that's in front of us, 18.1. <laughs> okay, we, we took it as they were moved. So they were, they were going to be voted on. So um, anybody else to speak? <laughs> <Of course. laughs>
Okay, great. I just uh, quickly just want to say, um, I think, uh, you know, Con Councillor Thompson's exactly right. We all have memories of Golden Mile. My mom worked at Consumers Distributing. Um, that's, uh, you know, uh, it was funny. We were all talking about that on Facebook and how well that, that company would do during COVID. Um, but, uh, you know, I also shopped at Bargain Herald's that was in the plaza there. And I remember when the superstore opened and I was just in awe that a grocery store could be that big and sell something besides groceries. So, um, um, you know, Golden Mile is is a really a, a central focal point of Scarborough. It is so important that the Queen cut the ribbon to open it when it initially opened. And you know, fortunately, with having uh, Deputy Mayor Thompson and Councillor Crawford spearheading this great initiative to revitalize this area, I'm pretty sure that we can maybe get uh, Her Majesty back um, uh, to cut the ribbon again. So I think we can make that a lofty goal for all of us. And thank you so much uh, to the councillors, the local councillors that are um, working through this very difficult and long process, but I'm sure we will all appreciate uh, the hard work of themselves and staff. Um, pending no other speakers, I think we can move to vote on Councillor Thompson's two items that he's moved. We'll pull them up one at a time. You have a recorded vote, please, Madam Chair. Okay, Councillor Thompson, so this is your motion one on the screen. When it switches back, we'll move to the recorded vote. Okay, recorded vote. Oh, I get to call it. Okay, Councillor Thompson, Councillor Lai, Councillor Crawford, Councillor Ainsley, and myself. We'll pull the second motion up. Councillor Thompson, did you want this one recorded as well? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Okay, when we switch back. Uh, Councillor Thompson, Councillor Lai, Councillor Crawford, Councillor Ainsley, and myself, both unanimous. Thank you. We now need to, um, would uh, somebody like to move the, uh, the supplemental report? They'll pull this up. I'll defer to my colleague, Councillor Crawford. Oh, sorry, okay. Um, so we'll move Councillor uh, Councilor Crawford, yeah. we'll move it. We'll change yes. that. Okay, um, so then uh, we'll vote on the supplemental report. When the screen switches back, all those in favor? All those opposed? Item carries. Um, motion as, uh, sorry, the item as amended. All those in favor? All those opposed? We'll note that that is unanimous. Thank you very much, everybody, um, and those of you that attended on the line to speak to this important item for Scarborough 18.1. Um, that brings us to 18.7, traffic calming Keeler Boulevard between Nielsen Avenue, sorry, Nielsen Road and David Drive in Ward 24. I understand we have a deputant on the line, Dee Cunningham. Hello. Hi, thank you for um, waiting um, and you have five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Community Council and good morning. I am one of the individuals responsible for the 2019 petition supporting speed bumps on Keeler Boulevard, the other being my neighbor, Megan Minicello. I've lived in this community since 1968. Speeding was less an issue when Brooks Road Public School was at the east end of this stretch of Keeler. There were fewer houses prior to the new developments, and people were more cautious of speeding in a school zone. For the petition, we were able to contact a member of almost every household principally affected by the speeding on Keeler, those on Keeler itself and the three crescents to the north side, Tweed Rock, Eden Mills, and Sandrift, resulting in a petition being signed by 92.3% of the households on these streets. Of 212 households, 197 signed the petition. There was not one household we contacted on Keeler Boulevard that was opposed to the speed bumps, but there were two that we never found home. The traffic study showed that the 85th percentile was 55 kilometers an hour in a 40 kilometer zone. Absolute proof we have a speeding problem on Keeler. The outliers of this data are the real concern. There are vehicles traveling 70 and 80 kilometers an hour on this quiet residential street. Studies by U.S. National Traffic Safety Admin have shown that in vehicle pedestrian collisions, 5% of those hit are killed when the vehicle is going 32 kilometers an hour, 40% are killed when the vehicle is traveling 48 uh, kilometers an hour, 
and almost all pedestrians are killed when the vehicle is traveling 80 kilometers an hour. 48 kilometers an hour, a speed at which 40% of those hit are killed, is well below the 85th percentile of the killer data. The residents on the streets of Tweed Rock, Eden Mills, and Sandrift, as well as the north side of Keeler, all have to cross Keeler to get to the park, the playground, and the post box. There is no crosswalk on this street, and it is dangerous to cross this street, especially for the elderly and children. It is even disturbing to walk on the sidewalk of Keeler when you're a mere 10 feet from cars zooming by. The Center for Transportation Research and Education at Iowa State University, Project 0073, has shown that speed bumps result in a 40% decrease in speed for most vehicles, more so for excessive speeders. But most importantly, the results do not revert over time. Other traffic calming measures, such as signs reminding drivers to slow down, which we have tried time and again on Keeler, lose efficacy with age, but the reduction in speed from speed bumps remains long after drivers become accustomed to their presence. Studies by European Commission on Mobility and Transport have shown that speed bumps cause drivers to become more aware of their surroundings, and therefore they more safely share the road with pedestrians, cyclists, skateboarders, children running to the park or onto the street to retrieve an errant soccer ball or a dog following his nose to the edge of the curb or the elderly lady crossing to the post box. Yes, speed bumps will slow traffic and prevent serious injury or fatality, but they will do something more important. They will give the residents their community back. As Keeler slows down, more people will walk this street as it will be more hospitable to them. I have an elderly mother, and we don't cross Keeler to sit in the park anymore because she couldn't get out of the way of a car if she ever had to. And that's an injustice caused to her by non-law-abiding drivers. An elderly resident who has lived in this community for 53 years cannot enjoy her own park anymore because she doesn't feel safe enough crossing Keeler to get into it. And she is not the only one. The neighborhood and people's behaviors are changing in response to the worsening situation on Keeler. This is the most insidious aspect of the speeding problem on Keeler. The quality of life in the community is deteriorating. Healthy behaviors that we should all undertake, walking more, sitting in the park, enjoying nature, taking in fresh air, are being slowly eroded by the danger and even the noise pollution of excessive speeders on Keeler. In closing, I wish to mention that of the seven households who refused to sign our petition, each mentioned the fact that speed bumps either do not work, something we know to be false, they do work, and that they're inconvenient, which we can all agree that they are. There is only one perfect solution for this, and that's the driver's slow down voluntarily. It's been tried, and it has never happened. The situation is worsening, and speed bumps are absolutely necessary here. Almost all of the residents of these streets, those that signed our petition, are able to put their concern for their neighbors and their community be of, above their personal animus for speed bumps. Speed bumps have had only positive effects on the streets of Blythewood and Bayview and Eglinton area and Fallingbrook and the beaches, just to name two. Speeding has been greatly reduced on those streets and making a much safer neighborhood. The fact that Keeler lacks the 2,500 vehicles per day is the only warrant not satisfied. Waiting until we have 500 more speeders per day along this quiet street is not the answer this community is looking for, and we are very, very grateful for Councillor Ainsley's support of this community request. Thank you, Madam Chair, Council members, for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay. Uh, we can move. Councillor Ainsley. Sorry, was that? Councillor Ainsley? Uh, questions? Yeah, um, I don't really have questions. I, I just want to thank the deputant uh, for, for being online this morning and all the work that she did reaching out to all the residents in the community. As I said, I don't have any questions. What she said is uh, very nicely encapsulated the concerns of the neighborhood uh, as well as mine. So I'd just like to thank her for all of her work spearheading this effort. Thank you very much, and thank you right back to you for taking it into your consideration. Okay. Um, are there any questions of staff on this item? Okay. Speakers? Uh, Councillor Ainsley. Okay. Councillor Ainsley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I do have uh, a motion that uh, I would like to move. Uh, it's basically, so the recommendations before us today by staff 
are not to install speed humps or speed bumps on uh, Keeler Boulevard. So what I'm doing is deleting recommendation number one, uh, asking my colleagues to support waiving the petition and polling requirements for Keeler Boulevard between Nielsen Road and David Drive uh, for the installation of uh, speed humps and also reducing the speed limit on Keeler Boulevard from 40 kilometers to 30 kilometers. Um, and I just want to reinforce uh, what the deputy said this morning. Ms. Cunningham, Cunningham has lived on Keeler Boulevard since 1968. Uh, I know that all of us uh, have concerns around speeding in Scarborough. Uh, my monthly town hall meetings, speeding in any given neighborhood is the number one concern of residents. One of the things that I've been trying to deal with in 43 Division the past few, few years is we only have two dedicated police officers that do full-time speed enforcement and traffic operations in Ward 43. So I'm working with residents to look at alternatives uh, to make their streets safer. Uh, in this case, residents uh, have We've been you know, we've had police traffic enforcement over the years. Um, we've looked at crosswalks, stop signs. Keeler Boulevard is about uh, 400 yards long, so it's a very long straight street. Uh, as the deputy mentioned, it did have a public school on it if, until a few years ago when it was closed down and uh, redeveloped in a residential neighborhood. So that increased the level of vehicles in the community. Um, the school being there did slow traffic down on Keeler, um, but the school is gone now. So um, residents have asked for uh, speed bumps on Keeler. Uh, once the petition was brought forward, I also uh, sent a flyer to all the adjacent streets, alerting them to the fact that there's a petition for speed bumps on this street. Uh, and the vast majority of residents that came back and contacted my office uh, support their neighbors on Keeler uh, and uh, are fully supportive of speed bumps as well. So I'm asking my colleagues to support this motion and uh, help me keep the residents on Keeler safer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Ainsley. Uh, anybody else to speak on this item? Councillor Thompson, sorry, Deputy Mayor Thompson. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I, I just wanted to speak in support of um, the Deputy and Councillor Ainsley. Um, it wasn't too long ago that we were always mindful or concerned about, you know, speed humps, speed bumps on in our community because of the concerns that we had around fire and ambulance services and so on. But I understand now that certainly fire trucks and the ambulance services will get to their calls and um, obviously as, as quickly as, uh, as possible to be able to assist those who are in need. Madam Chair, I've noticed and I think we all have a tremendous lack of concern, lack of regards um, uh, that's playing out on our streets of Toronto. Um, drivers uh, seeming to not care about speed limits and are just simply uh, blazing away. Um, I can't tell you how many times just this week where I've actually been traveling the speed limit in neighborhoods, some of them are my own neighborhoods, where the vehicle behind me uh, gets into a burst of speed and has to speed in excess of the actual speed limit because people either don't want to wait, they're in such a big rush, and it is causing a major problem. For the very first time in my community, we are working with staff on the Im implementation of speed bumps on um, a street in my ward, which is um, Bertrand. Uh, people are using Bertrand from Kennedy Road and or Birchmount and they're speeding to through the neighborhood. Uh, there's a school and obviously it's a residential area. So the time has actually come, as Councillor Ainsley has indicated, one of the top issues in my area as well is um, speeding and the impact of traffic. And we've seen the impact on roadways, whether or not it's the occurrences with cyclists or just the occurrences with pedestrians, some who have in fact lost their lives or paid the ultimate price. And so I think the uh, duty for us is to do more. And as the um, deputy spoke earlier, if people would just simply, you know, if use, in essence, common sense and be patient and be more concerned in terms of their speed and so on, we wouldn't have to introduce these type of measures. But regrettably, and it isn't just simply because of COVID, maybe COVID has heightened it and so on. 
but uh, people have been speeding for quite some time and they continue to do so with the um, you know added additional complement of getting the new police units as well as utilizing technology we have to do more to safeguard and protect the um, the residents in our in our community so i wholeheartedly support uh, councillor ainsley's uh, motion and uh, i do think that we all should because we're all in this same condition where people don't pay attention they're driving too fast and in fact are willing to overtake you whether or not it's in a school zone or other areas and it is causing a problem for our community so i think that we need to do more thank you okay thank you uh <coughs> any other speakers on this item Okay, we'll pull up uh, Councilor Ainsley, Ainsley's motion. Okay, thank you. The motion is before us. When we switch screens, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? All those opposed? Item carries. Uh, that brings us to item 1810, all way stop control on Beach Grove Drive and Fergalee Avenue in Ward 25. I believe we have Terry Stenton on the line. Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Community Council. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar, this section of Beach Grove, Beach Grove Drive is a relatively long, windy residential road. Uh, we have three particularly dangerous blind corners, no sidewalks, uh, and limited lighting as well. It's, it's frankly just simply an, an old street in Scarborough. Uh, so given that nature, speed has been a long-term issue here uh, along this residential street. Uh, it's not uncommon to see multiple cars going 60 plus, uh, including large transport trucks, uh, particularly in the morning or after work from employees leaving or going to work at the city-owned uh, water treatment plant at the end of the street. Uh, these risks have been exacerbated by the lack of sidewalks and infrastructure mentioned before. Uh, in fact, it as was once referred to me by a city staff member as a fun road to drive on. So something that uh, I personally didn't take very lightly because I truly believe that uh, residential streets should not be quote unquote fun. Uh, although not this year, uh, police have come here for well over five years uh, at what I'm sure is a very large expense to the city. Uh, those efforts absolutely do work, although they are short-lived uh, and the speed picks back up the moment they leave. Uh, the street is frankly dangerous to have a family on. Uh, we've seen multiple close calls with children, daycares, um, and just kids walking to William Miller Public School uh, in the morning. Uh, personally, this kids very close to home. I know all too well the scars um, that speed-related fatalities um, leave on a family. At 11, I lost my 15-year-old brother to uh, an accident that was completely unavoidable, um, or sorry, completely avoidable uh, related to speed. So I realize this is a lot of context for basically what amounts to um, a stop sign, and in short, I wholeheartedly agree that we need to do something at the corner of Beach Grove and Fergola uh, at a minimum we believe that it would help reduce some of the dangers in one of the blind corners uh, and hopefully put a small dent into some of the speed. Uh, that said, I'm also joining to say that we, the residents in this neighborhood, do not feel that this is enough to solve the root cause of the issue, which is the speed. Uh, as such, I would urge that additional measures be considered in the future, uh, including lowering speed limits to 30 kilometers an hour, speed humps, chicanes, uh, older roads such as ours without sidewalks, I do believe are given a bit of an unfair shake um, given the, the lack of infrastructure to meet traffic calming measures. Um, but my hope is that new initiatives such as Zero Vision, uh, we can create some, some safer communities. Um, I will also admit on a personal level, uh, both my wife and I now work for, for rather large companies, one of them located in Scarborough. Uh, and through COVID, we've now confirmed that uh, working from home permanently uh, is now an option. And I will admit it is hard for us to consider staying in areas like Scarborough as a 20 something year old family for the simple fact of raising children here has become uh, what I believe is increasingly difficult to justify relative to newer communities such as uh, Ajax or Durham region. Um, the infrastructure here is old and speed uh, is honestly one of our biggest concerns when we consider um, long-term possibilities for raising a family. Uh, that's all I had to say today, so thank you, councillors, for your time. 
Uh, thank you for uh, your deputation. Um, can I just ask you, um, do you think your street would be amenable to installation of sidewalks? Uh, I will admit I've only lived here for a few years, and my understanding is that has been tried before, uh, and that it is probably unlikely that uh, you would have um, the support needed. Okay. Uh, well, I am happy that we have this, uh, well, uh, sorry, I guess it has to speak. Gosh, I'm not even following my own church rules. Um, thank you so much for your deputation. We'll move to questions of staff and then to speak. Any questions of staff? Uh, anyone to speak to this item? Uh, I'll just speak uh, quickly on this item as it, as it is in my ward. Um, Beach Grove is, is a speeding problem. We are constantly out there dropping off watch your speed signs. Um, it's disappointing that we're not able to put automated speed enforcement on streets that don't have school zones. I think that this would be an ideal candidate. I'm hopeful that the city will explore how they can start to expand that program onto streets like this. We have put in the watch your speed sign on numerous occasions. Um, we've been told that speed bumps aren't an option because there aren't sidewalks and we have to worry that cars will try to weave onto the edges around so it could actually end up being um, also unsafe for pedestrians. So uh, we are continuing to work with staff on, on what we can do in Beach Grove. I wanna thank the community for uh, their ongoing ag advocacy on the street. Um, I, I tell them we can only solve problems that we know about. Uh, we get uh, complaints about speeding. We've passed those on to Toronto Police regularly. I know they have been out there for enforcement, but as Councillor Ainsley said earlier on, uh, there simply just isn't enough uh, speed enforcement officers in the city. So uh, this is a work in progress. It is a step in the right direction. I'd like to thank the deputant for taking the time out of his day uh, to come here and speak to us today. Um, if there's no other speakers, we can move to the item. Sorry, Madam Chair. Yes. Sorry, it's Councillor Ainsley. Sorry, with your indulgence and my colleagues' indulgence, could I just, uh, I wanted to ask just one question of transportation staff. I wanted to understand uh, how they're rolling out the speed limit reductions around schools. I have a, a street in my ward with a high school on it. The speed limit was, re was reduced to 30 kilometers on an adjacent street with a grade school. Um, the speed limit's still 40 kilometers and it hasn't been reduced. I just like to understand how they're rolling out that program. So I know we went through questions. I think we'll reword your question. Um, so that it's also related to this item as there is no school there, but how are we rolling out the speed reductions in areas with schools versus not schools on streets like this? Maybe that keeps it in scope. Um, can transportation sure. answer that? So, hi everyone, through the chair. Um, thank you for the question. So uh, in accordance with the Vision Zero uh, 2.0 road safety program policy that was adopted by council last year, uh, council adopted a speed management strategy that addresses speeds on all different road classes across the city. Um, so speed is being addressed based on the road classification arterials, collectors, and then locals, uh, based on the roads with the highest speeds coming down first. So right now, uh, major arterials have all been completed. The minor arterials and the collectors, I believe, are in progress. I'm sorry, I don't have the exact timing. Uh, and then they're going to start the strategy for the local roads. Um, also adopted through the Vision Zero program was a different bit of a strategy for signage and uh, on local roads, where we're going to community-based signage. What that means is there will be signage at the entrances along with pavement markings to each community. So maybe not every street will be signed, but there'll be a new signage where once you enter the community, says this is a 30 kilometer zone, for example. And local roads such as these uh, roads you just discussed uh, would be going down to 30, and that will be rolled out over uh, five years, I believe beginning in 2021, is what the uh, Vision Zero Council report said. Okay, thank you. Um, pending no other questions or speakers, we'll move to the item. Sorry, Madam Chair, could yep. we, could Mr. Mr. Brown, could you send that uh, as a briefing note to each of us? Okay. It's, it's already outlined in the uh, council report. If you'd like, I can send that uh, a copy of that excerpt over. That would be great. Thank you. No problem. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, we'll vote on the item. All those in favor? 
All those opposed, the item carries. That brings us to our last item, 18.12, application to remove a private tree at 57 Pegasus Trail. I believe we have a speaker, uh, Sadusha Arulam Palam. Uh, good morning, counselors. Um, I live at 57 Pegasus Trail with my family, so thank you for having me here. Um, I'd like to start off by saying that our intention was to always plant another suitable tree. We do care about this neighborhood and would like to improve the quality of the urban life. Um, I want to share some notes from my neighbor, Bob, who is also affected by this tree. The a pine tree was planted 55 years ago by the previous owner with no thought of how large the tree would grow. It is a wild tree, much too large for our subdivision. It was taken from a forest in the cottage country. The previous owner has told me on several occasions that he wanted to remove it for the same reasons, but the expense of doing this was more than he wanted to spend at the time. According to my neighbor, Bob, the tree roots had started to show on our lawns during the last five to six years. Just last year, we had them cut for him as it extended over to the, his side of the lawn. The tree is already about 60 to 70 feet tall, and we are worried that it may cause damage to the houses with the recent increasing high winds. Pine trees are not suitable for residential properties because the roots require higher amounts of nu uh, nutrients, which take away from the growth of other plants and grass. We have noticed that ever since we moved here, no matter how hard we try to take care of our lawn, the grass does not appear as healthy as the rest of the neighborhood. The pines are extremely difficult to clean up. We even had a lot of pines um, getting blown over our roof and um, to our backyard. We are constantly unclogging the eaves trough from overflowing and it isn't very practic practical to do this all year round. All trees have debris, but this specific one has sap. It, it acts like glue and it gets all over our vehicles. It's been very rough trying to remove this without damaging the paint on my car. I did go over the notes and it did mention that the branches do not hang over the driveway. I can send you another picture. The branches do extend over the driveway and the pines and sap do get all over the driveway and vehicles, especially when there's rain and wind. So my mother has um, always had pine po pine pollen and pine nut allergies and it's gotten worse over the past year she has a hard time especially during the spring and it's very uncomfortable for her it's very unfortunate uh, to have this tree in our front yard with all these issues that it had caused my family although trees do provide better quality of neighborhoods we have not seen any benefits from this one uh, we hope you can understand everything from our perspective and grant us our wish of replacing this pine tree with a more suitable tree. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Questions of the deputant? Uh, Councilor Ainsley? Oh, yep. Um, thank you for coming in this morning. Could you explain a bit about uh, how long you've lived in, your, in the house? Uh, it's just been over two years. It's almost going into three. Okay. And when your family bought the house, they didn't they didn't appreciate the tree then or you know, you've you've raised some concerns about the eavesdrop and sap dripping on your tree, but um none of this was raised by the previous owner or um, so when we actually bought the house, um, no, this was not mentioned to us, but uh, we quickly realized as soon as we moved in and just talking to our neighbor, Bob, he, cause, because it's actually, it's been bothering him as well. He, he's, he had uh, told us that this tree has been an issue for a long time, even for the previous owner, um, as they were really good friends. But we didn't know at the time when we purchased the house. Okay, and you, he hasn't been putting, like, you can put dirt over the re roots on the lawn. He hasn't been doing any type of that maintenance? Um, so, because, like, we weren't able to put dirt. But what my dad ended up doing is we actually just cut it out for him. Okay. and So, we, we've been doing it for him, yeah. And you, you haven't been trimming the branches back over the driveway? So the branches that are going over the driveway are the like the tallest branches. It's almost it's, it's impossible for us to do it on our own. My parents have been cutting the branches that are like they are able to reach with a ladder, but the ones at the very top we were not able to cut, and those are the ones that are actually going over the driveway. Okay, because because looking from the the picture that's in the report, it seems that the branches that are closest to the driveway are the lowest ones. 
Yeah, so um, I actually did see that picture. It actually cuts off uh, from the driveway point. So I don't know if you can see the, the top branches, but even from the angle from my house, you can see that the some of the top branches, they are leaning over at least the back of the driveway. And, that's, and since we have four cars, we do stack up our cars. So it does still get all over the cars, at least like the back two cars. Okay, all right, thank you. Those are my questions, yeah. Madam Chair. No problem. Thank you. Any other questions of the deputant? Questions of staff? Uh, Councillor Ainsley? Councillor Ainsley? Yep. Um, thank you. Through you, Madam Chair, to the forestry staff. So um, this is a, a tree. It's 46 centimeters in diameter. Uh, yes. And it seems in your consideration, it's a healthy tree. That is correct, Your Honor. And could you speak, speak a bit about um, community benefits of a tree this large and what it would bring, does for the community in terms of benefits in tree canopy? Um, the white pine is uh, the provincial tree uh, of Ontario. Um, it's uh, probably the most uh, recognizable tree other than uh, maples. Um, for a lot of Canadians. Um, as far as economic benefits, uh, mature trees definitely reduce energy consumption by reducing the, the, uh, the direct sunlight on, on a roof of a house during the summer. Um, they, they reduce winds around houses or redirect them depending on how they're, how they're planted. Certainly that's specific to locations. Um, the other big advantage of urban trees is uh, absorption of stormwater and uh, reducing the costs of, uh, of water uh, treatment, which is a huge expense to the city. Okay. And in terms of um, a tree such as this, the deputy would be able to, to trim back the lower branches over the driveway without detrimentally affecting the tree, I would assume. Yeah, they can do that. I could certainly uh, en engage a professional arborist to give them the best advice on how to how to deal with that. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Those are my questions, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, so I think we can move to the item. Uh, is there anybody else to speak? Okay. Uh, so the item is presented. Okay. All those in favor? All those opposed? I think we're going to have to try this one more time. All those in favor of staff recommendations? Okay. All those opposed? Okay. The uh, staff recommendations carry. Thank you. Um, that uh, concludes the agenda. We have some housekeeping. Okay. Uh, we'll put them up. Um, Councillor Lai, can I have you move the first one? Well, just change my name. Sorry. Didn't realize my name came up on them. So, Councillor Lai, are you happy to move that? <laughs> Yes, I'd be glad to, uh, Madam Chair, that Scarborough Community Council pass and declare as bylaw bills 856 to 860 prepared for the October 16, 2020 meeting 18 of the Community Council. Uh, thank you, Councillor Lai. Councillor Ainsley, would you like to move a second motion? That the Scarborough Community Council pass and declare as a bylaw a confirmatory bill to confirm the legislative proceedings of the Scarborough Community Council acting under delegated authority at meeting number 18 on October 16th, 2020. Thank you. We'll vote on those two items. All those in favor? All those opposed? That concludes our meeting. Thank you very much to everybody uh, for attending, all of those that participated virtually from both the city and from the community. Uh, that's a wrap. Thanks a lot. Great job, Madam Chair. Everybody stay safe and well.